We're excited to welcome you all to week two of NCAT's third annual conference, Growing Hope, Practical Tools for Our Changing Climate. I'm Margo Hale, NCAT's ATRA Program Director. Since 1976, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCAT, has been working toward a more sustainable future from our home base in Butte, Montana, and now with staff in 11 states around the country. Last week, we heard from speakers on the cutting edge of research and practice, including Dr. Rattown Lal, Dr. Jeff Creek, Mark Schoenbeck, and farmers and ranchers implementing carbon farm plans and growing soil fertility bio bio <laughs> biologically. We hope you are here for the live presentations, but if you missed them, you can find them on the NCAT ATRA YouTube channel. During week two of the conference, we will focus on different ways farmers and ranchers can heal the land, build soil health, and support thriving ecosystems. Today's topic is agroforestry, and Thursday, we hope you'll join us again for a conversation on grazing for climate. And in case you haven't already checked your mailbox, we've sent the first 600 registrants a conference workbook printed on recycled paper and sent them directly to you. So please follow along in the workbook where you'll find the six session schedule, questions to consider, and a space to write down your ideas and takeaways. If you'd like to print out your own workbook, you can download it at atra.ncat.org slash annual dash conference. Before we dive in, we'd like to acknowledge our conference sponsors. This year's conference is free for all attendees and that's been made possible by the generous support of NCAT, ATRA Sustainable Agriculture, USDA Rural Development, Rural South Institute, Western SARE, Hemp Industries Association, and Clearwater Credit Union. Thank you. Today, we will hear from agroforestry experts from around the country. I will turn things over to NCAT's agroforestry specialist, Catherine Faber. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to today's session on agroforestry. Uh, for those not familiar with the term, agroforestry is the intentional integration of trees into crop and or livestock systems to improve farm productivity, economic resilience, and ecosystem services. Agroforestry systems can overyield by producing multiple products within a single system while simultaneously providing benefits to the farm and the greater ecosystem by creating wildlife habitat, sequestering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, improving soil fertility, and so much more. And when we think about hope in the midst of a changing climate, agroforestry stands out as one particularly important tool in our toolbox with the potential to sequester up to 18 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per acre per year and the ability to support vast populations of wildlife. So today we are so honored to have with us many agroforestry experts who will be talking about the various ways that agroforestry practices can be incorporated into our farmscapes to benefit both the farm and the climate. So I'd like to start by introducing you to our first speakers, so who we are so honored to have with us today. We have Kate McFarland and Gary Bentrep with the USDA National Agroforestry Center. Kate McFarland is an agroforester with the USDA National Agroforestry Center, and her work focuses on providing leadership for national and regional workshops and trainings, 
developing outreach materials for science delivery to a range of technical and general audiences, and supporting the integration of agroforestry into USDA programs. Kate is also involved with research on human dimensions and ecosystem services of agroforestry systems, and she has been a great personal mentor to me over the years. So Kate, thank you so much for being here. And we also have with us Gary Bentrep. Gary Bentrep is a research landscape planner at the USDA National Agroforestry Center, and his research focuses on developing resources for designing multifunctional agroforestry practices to achieve environmental stewardship and production objectives. He received a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture from Kansas State University and a Master of Landscape Architecture from Utah State University, and he grew up on a farm near Deerfield, Kansas. So we are so excited to have you both with us here today. And as a reminder to everyone, the session is being recorded and will be posted to the NCAT ATRA YouTube page. And we'll have 15 minutes at the end dedicated for a live Q&A with the panelists. So please feel free to write your questions in the chat. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Kate and Gary. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, let me just start to share my screen. And how does that look? All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And, and we're really excited to be here today. Uh, it's great to see uh, NCAT hosting a, a specific uh, session on agroforestry. And so I think really agroforestry is just kind of coming into its time. I've been involved with agroforestry uh, for uh, about 23 years at the National Agroforestry Center, although I think I was destined to get involved with agroforestry. Uh, as a kid, I was exploring the options of growing uh, forest botanicals in my uh, parents' shelter belts around the farm. Um, as mentioned, Kate and I are with the USDA National Agroforestry Center, which is a partnership between U.S. Forest Service and the NRCS, or Natu Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and we conduct basically uh, research on agroforestry as well as we do science delivery and training on agroforestry. So moving into the uh, talk, let me advance the slide. Let's see, there we go, a little delay. Um, we'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement. I reside in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is the historical territories of the Pawnee and Oto uh, tribes, while Kate resides in Ver Burlington, Vermont, which is the territories of the Donland Confederacy and the Abenaki. And we offer this land acknowledgement, not as an endpoint, but really just as a starting point for improved respect and dialogue uh, with, with the uh, indigenous and native tribes of the United States. And this is really important within agroforestry because agroforestry's history is rooted in indigenous communities. They have long practiced agroforestry, uh, both in tropical and temperate uh, systems, and continue today to practice agroforestry to achieve a variety of resource objectives that connects with that local traditional ecological knowledge. And today we can also through dialogue and respect benefit from uh, that knowledge in partnership. So uh, a little bit on this particular presentation that Kate and I have put together is to talk just briefly about kind of agricultural productivity under climate change and how agroforestry can offer an option to help create those more resilient landscapes and operations. But we want the bulk of the presentation to focus on what are tools available for producers uh, to do agroforestry, uh, particularly in the context of climate change. And then what are USDA programs and resources that can help from basically the whole cycle of the supply chain from implementing an agroforestry project through marketing and sewing. So, you know, again, a lot of us have seen information on, on climate change and it's uh, no need to, uh, 
to cover it in, in depth too much, but there are a few things I think are important to tie into why agroforestry can be a great tool for resiliency. And here are some of the key variables affecting agricultural productivity. Um, you know, things changes in our frost-free days, the number of consecutive dry days, uh, in particular also the number of hot days. And this is really critical with some crop production as well as livestock. So we've got these changes and we can see it's not hitting the United States equally. There's gonna be areas that where some of these impacts are greater. We also can look at extreme precipitation events going up. Uh, this shows protected changes in the increased number of 20 year extreme events. And basically all of the country will have an uptick in these events that could increase soil erosion and reduce soil productivity. And then it's not only the intensity, but also the seasonality. We see from um, both uh, past change as well as predicted, we're going to see probably more precipitation generally coming in the winter and spring. Uh, and, and this is going to also have an impact on agricultural production. And we've already seen the impacts of these kind of extreme weather events. Uh, this is a great tool, uh, Ag Risk Viewer. Um, and I should say that I have, we have a lot of links in our, our tools uh, or resources. And, Kate will probably be dropping in links, but we can also make this PowerPoint available. But this uh, shows just how much uh, uh, payment identity has been a result of uh, extreme weather events. And you know, why there's been a whole variety of extreme weather events, drought and precipitation uh, are, are the two top ones. And so when we think about creating resilient landscapes, a uh, risk management is really difficult in monoculture systems because um, you've got all your eggs in one basket. And when we diversify through agroforestry systems with perennial uh, uh, shrubs and trees, uh, we create that resiliency. And so for instance, the slide below shows an alley cropping system of, uh, of uh, sunflowers and, and um, uh, willows, and while the interim crop in the alleyways was lost due to um, flooding, the willows did okay, and there was a biomass crop harvested off of that. And so it creates this resiliency in these extreme weather events. And we can see what we accomplish with agroforestry is the ability to not op maximize for one ecosystem good service or goods, but really work to achieve a variety of ecosystem services and goods. And, you know, I like to think, you know, why we're really focused on climate change these days, it's really the icing on the uh, cake in terms of what agroforestry has to offer. It's really these other benefits that are foundational, uh, in my opinion, and then the mitigation and adaptation benefits that are provided by agroforestry are just kind of the, uh, the cherry on the top. You know, we have ability to uh, enhance the microclimate, uh, which can help with uh, crop production, reduce evaporative loss, uh, reduce soil erosion, which can translate into increased crop yields, anywhere from six to 56%, depending on crop type. You've got the ability to support uh, beneficial insects uh, like pollinators and uh, predators. Uh, also the ability to create kind of some new edible and marketable products uh, are just some of the examples that agroforestry can offer when we look at this suite of uh, multiple ecosystem services that can be offered. And then when we get back to the climate change piece, um, there's really two big buckets that climate or that agroforestry can affect. And that's both the adaptation side, which is to enhance that resiliency, which I've kind of mentioned before. And then there's also the mitigation side, the ability to actually be a solution to uh, some of our climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a really nice win-win kind of solution. Um, to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the adaptation services, so here's just kind of a chart that shows what are some of the uh, 
ways that agroforestry can support adaptation. You know, that perennial cover uh, provides uh, greater resistance to uh, erosion events. It helps modify some of those microclimate, those um, events where we've got heat stress for livestock. Um, and those are kind of some of the crop and livestock benefits. Um, but then also too, on kind of a larger landscape uh, vision, it can help with possibly plant species migration uh, to help support uh, plant biodiversity over time, as well as travel corridors for uh, wildlife movement to find basically suitable locations under climate change. And then as we move into mitigation, we have the ability to sequester carbon, both in woody biomass and, and soil, but also there's some other opportunities to reduce some of the other greenhouse gas emissions uh, through reduced fossil fuel consumption where uh, you're not running equipment through uh, tree rows and so forth. So those are kind of some of the broad things. And, and what I think is exciting is we have done this before with agroforestry on a large scale to address climate change. And in the 1930s with the Dust Bowl, uh, the US government launched the Prairie States Forestry Project. And you know, this was an area that was really rendered uh, unproductive with dust storms and soil erosion. And the Shelter Belt Project, or this Prairie States Forestry Project, installed over 18,000 miles of windbreaks across 30,000 farms across from North Dakota down to Northern Texas, and made a generational impact on, on this region. Uh, we like to think maybe that era of the Dust Bowls is gone, but it is still happening today. There was an event in the uh, uh, just outside of Lincoln a couple years ago that resulted in a 29 car pileup and a fatality. And this usually happens at least once a year in the region. And with climate change, uh, it's estimated that uh, wind erosion and soil erosion is likely to increase. So now I'd like to dive into actually the meat of it and talk about what are some of the tools for producers and technical service providers uh, to kind of start to utilize uh, agroforestry. And we've put them into a couple buckets, planning and design tools, climate prediction, plant materials, and greenhouse gas tools. So within the agroforestry plan and design tools, um, there's a suite of tools. And I'm going to kind of run through these kind of quick. They're just kind of letting you know, know they're out there. Um, and by no means uh, are these the only tools available or even the best tools available. They're just to kind of provide an awareness of what's out there uh, and to give you a good starting point for that uh, rich diversity of decision support information that is available uh, to embark on agroforestry. And, and the first part of any project, uh, you know, as we all know, is really a planning process. How do you approach something? And there's tons of planning processes out there. There's the NRCS nine-step process. And if you're working with NRCS uh, to use some of their uh, programs, uh, they'll go through this process and it's a great process. Uh, there's also agroforestry specific planning process, such as this one from the Center of Agroforestry that works you through step-by-step step, kind of the things to consider for implementing agroforestry. And then kind of moving on from that, getting into the details, another kind of um, uh, tool I think is this kind of simple decision matrix tool. And it's something you can lay out on your own. It's where you could put up the different functions that you want to achieve with agroforestry, whether it's shade for livestock, whether it's to produce an edible product for livestock or for human consumption. And then you can think about what are those criteria for the design based on these kind of categories? Where would it best be on the topography? Is it better on a flat or slope or on a concave? And work through to see how are these things, are they compatible or not? And here's just a quick example, this one being a riparian forest buffer but for the different functions you might have a riparian forest buffer for, such as maintaining water temps for cold water fisheries or for bank erosion. And we can see based on kind of the information that's out there, 
uh, the width for water temperatures is wider than some of the other functions. And so if you want to achieve the water temperature function, you would need to go for that wider uh, function to capture all of the functions. So it's just a way of, of working through that design and planning process. Um, at the National Agroforestry Center, we have a variety of kind of resources, these info sheets that can help provide information to feed into that planning and design process. And here's some that are specific to climate change. We also have some indexes on our uh, site uh, where we try to catalog. There's over 181 webinars that you can sort by agroforestry practice. And this is uh, webinars by many different partners across the country, as well as we um, tried to pull out an index on SARE, uh, uh, Agricultural Research and Education Grants that had some aspect of agroforestry. And again, you can search on these and get more information on these kind of projects. They're great starting points. Uh, another resource we have is the Conservation Buffer Design Guideline Handbook. Uh, this synthesizes research into design guidelines for designing basically linear agroforestry practices uh, for these kind of uh, suite of ecosystem services. Um, the exciting news is this came out in 08. And since then, there's been a, a bit of research, uh, new research that we are currently going through right now, and we should have an updated version in 2024. There's other great resources by many of our partners and, and this planting tree crops by the Savannah Institute is a really nice kind of meaty hands-on detail for installing uh, agroforestry practices. There's also this uh, edible agroforestry design templates by Backyard Abundance. And it goes through kind of different uh, practices and, and what could be a suite of plant species to actually produce uh, uh, edible food. Uh, I should also call out the Center for Agroforestry has this nice handbook for agroforestry planning and design where that planning process came out of. And want to give a call out to um, Megan Giroux and Eric Stonesmeyer, a current book they're working on right now, Civil Arable Agroforestry Manual. And having seen a draft of this, this is going to be a really uh, useful and nice resource. Um, so also, of course, want to give a call out to ATRA and NCAT. They've got great resources, as well as the uh, climate hubs uh, at USDA, and they're regionally organized. So now moving into climate prediction tools, um, you know, really to now kind of think, well, what are, how is the climate going to change for my area and how agroforestry could be uh, affected or used by it? So one is some just some narrative summaries is a good starting point. There's regional ones that are available that also have information specific to agriculture, as well as state ones that are available. But then there's some really nice online tools to allow you to drill in for your more specific location. And this one allows you to look at things like temperature, precipitation, uh, and pick your area and see what has been the uh, annual kind of trend, as well as what is the, the uh, estimated uh, change under these uh, a low emissions and a higher emissions uh, change. Another great resource is the Climate Toolbox. Uh, they have these organized by categories and there's the agricultural section, which has a number of really uh, useful tools. Uh, some are national and some are regional specific. But two I wanna call out is the future cold hardiness zones. This allows you to look at how uh, cold hardiness zones are changing, as well as the future climate dashboard. And this dashboard has a number of important factors that uh, influence agricultural productivity, such as chilling hours. And you can pick an area and then see what the historic chilling hours have been for your area, as well as what are the predicted in the uh, short-term changes in the chilling hours? And then what are the long-term changes? Because again, with agroforestry, we have a, 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 you know, these things are going in for kind of a period of time and we wanna make sure 
we're making uh, good choices. And, and that leads me to plant materials. And they're really the building blocks of agroforestry. And you know things that if you're incorporating nut and fruit uh, species in your production system, you know here's kind of a list of all the things you want to consider. And so we really want to be uh, conscientious in, in selecting the right plant material for our project. And so a good starting point is just the USDA plants database uh, has you know literally thousands of plants and has many that have. Uh, fairly in-depth plant guides in uh, PDF form that can serve as a great resource. Uh, there's also the Climate Change Tree Atlas. Um, and this is a project by the U.S. Forest Service. And it's really right now for the eastern part of the United States. It has 125 species. And they modeled how is climate change going to affect these species in terms of are they going to expand or contract in their uh, natural range. And um, while agroforestry is often involving uh, planted materials, which that can change the dynamics versus natural regeneration, this, uh, this resource can offer a great, um, a great starting point to consider, uh, are your species going to be, how adaptable will they be? Um, and so it's, you got here one that's pawpaw and um, it shows that the model for it isn't considered a really highly reliable one, but you can do a little bit of in-depth to figure out what are some of the positive and negative traits they think for that species under climate change. Why well, we've got the La Bali uh, pine, and, and that model is considered to be a little bit more reliable, and uh, you can find what are some of the criteria thinking that how it's going to change under climate change. Um, and another resource uh, at the National Agroforestry Center is the Tree Advisor. And this tool is currently for the Central and Northern Great Plains, but you can uh, go through and pick out of 14 different purposes, two different kind of criteria you're looking for or functions like uh, filtering runoff or flood protection. And then it will, based on the plant attributes, rank species based on how well they'll achieve that. Uh, and you can run it again and add more additional uh, functions and purposes and start to develop a plant list. And, and this tool right now, as I said, is for uh, a regional area, but with the hope that we'll be able to expand it. And then we're also uh, involved in a guidebook right now being developed uh, practice-based specific but for selecting plant materials for agroforestry practices and trying to give producers and technical service providers information on what are the desirable species attributes for different uh, purposes that you might be designing an agroforestry practice for. This guide will also have 90 species profiles that are gonna be around four to six pages that provide uh, information on what the species requires to grow, but also with a really good look at how it uh, would function in an agroforestry system and, and considerations around uh, that decision-making. And to wrap up the tools section, uh, last but not least, is thinking about it from uh, climate change. And there are tools out there for doing some uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, calculations of putting in agroforestry practices. Uh, both of these tools are in the comment uh, uh, toolkit uh, available. Um, and the first one is really probably the easiest to use. You can pick an agroforestry practice and specify the acreage and, and where you're at. And it will kind of give you a CO2 equivalent per year estimate of what your system might be able to uh, produce. Or reduce. And then there's Comet Farm, and it's a little bit more of an in-depth tool where you can actually pick species uh, for, say, a windbreak and kind of do a projection of the change in carbon stock over time. And so that's just, uh, again, these aren't the um, only tools available. It's just to provide a quick overview of what, what is some out there. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kate We'll be able to talk about some more um, uh, programs and resources uh, by USDA.
Thanks so much, Gary. And I'm hoping you're you're seeing my screen okay. Um, so Gary gave a great uh, background and information about how USDA and others have tools to help plan, design, and understand the impacts of agroforestry systems. Um, but we also, ha also have both tools and programs that really help to make to um, agroforestry systems successful, right? So um, we want to achieve all of these different carbon and other ecological benefits. Um, and so we, I want to talk a little bit through how, how we can do that in a way that works. Um, and in this conversation, you know, a lot of the time we tend to focus on how to fund the tree section. What can USDA to pay for my do to pay for my trees? Um, and I'll definitely talk about that today. But I think, you know, more thinking and more upfront work um, is needed to think about the whole supply chain for agroforestry, especially as Gary mentioned, when we're working with these specialty crops that maybe lack commodity markets or their crops that require some amount of processing or storage on their way to market. So I also wanna talk a little bit about that supply chain from land access, land conservation programs, production programs, processing programs, aggregation and distribution, and then markets and consumers. And how do we, as people who are excited about agroforestry and particularly the climate mitigation and climate adaptation benefits of agroforestry, mm, find a place for agroforestry and all these different programs that USDA offers. Um, so when I think about USDA programs across the supply chain, I find this, this PDF created by the Ag Marketing Service really helpful. Um, its focus is really on local food supply chains, but to be honest, the programs it talks about are rele relevant to supply chains with a number of different endpoints. Um, and I really appreciate their work and effort in thinking about how USDA programs um, fit into a supply chain and which programs are, are sort of most relevant to the different parts of our work. So I really rely on this and we'll share this resource um, and adapt it a little bit for an agroforestry context. Um, so let's dig in a little bit to all of these program opportunities within USDA relevant to agroforestry and to advancing our climate um, mitigation and adaptation goals. So one piece, the only thing that I feel, or maybe not the only thing, one thing that's missing from that AMS tool that I think is so important in an agroforestry context is thinking about the land access piece of a supply chain, right? We know that land access is so important to so many people interested in farming. Um, in general, people who are currently farming and want to expand their operations. Um, and I think it particularly comes up in agroforestry. They have, you know, ag people interested in agroforestry have particular land access challenges because you really can't operate on a year to year lease. You also, also often have business plans that work a little bit differently than people with annual crops or people who really have one main crop. Um, we're often growing different crops with different sort of timelines, cost and income timelines. Um, so to address this, and this isn't, I'm gonna get into USDA programs in a minute here, but you know, here at the National Agroforestry Center, we um, worked with Farm Commons in the Savannah Institute a few years ago to develop a workbook for developing long-term leases for agroforestry, as well as a set of case studies that sort of describe um, examples of innovative approaches to land access. And I just wanted to say up front, you know, land access is a really key topic and it's one we're continuing to work on. We're also seeing there are increasingly um, more and more economic tools um, for agroforestry. There's some on our National Agroforestry website that Gary and others have worked on, a non-timber forest, uh, non forest product calculator, a forest farming calculator that he's working on now, as well as economic tools um, created by other partners, um, such as the University of Wisconsin recently released a fruit and nut compass that can help with that business planning for agroforestry, which can help in getting a loan. With all that background, um, I'll get back to USDA programs. I really wanted to mention the Farm Service Agency loan programs. You know, FSA has always intended to be that lender of last resort, and they've developed a new tool on their website that helps in navigating the loan options. You supply information about yourself and what you're trying to do, and it gives you some ideas for loan options. Um, these may be, you know, the different kinds of farm ownership loans they offer, or even micro loans to help with one, one piece of your, your operation. Um, I also wanted to mention a new program that FSA has that's actually funded by the American Rescue Plan, um, intended, to, intended to help technical assistance providers help people launch, grow, um, and make resilient agricultural enterprises. And it, and it really is focused around some key issues, including 
um, heirs property challenges and other land access challenges. So now let's get into the land conservation stage in the supply chain. You know, I'll sp spend, a, spend a fair amount of time on this one because um, it's where we can really fund trees and establish agroforestry systems. Um, before we get into the specific programs, I want to talk about the sort of old fashioned image that I have on this slide. Um, like, like many activities that are carried out on our land, you know, agroforestry practices do have both production and conservation benefits. Um, but when we're talking about our federal conservation programs that provide technical and financial assistance to farmers and forest managers, they're really um, funded to implement conservation practices with conservation benefits. They really have to address those shared natural resource concerns that we have um, because these programs are using public dollars that are intended to have those co conservation benefits, those public conservation benefits. So that's sort of the, the context in which we're talking about um, these programs. I think of it sort of as putting on a conservation lens to agroforestry. And you know, right now there are real opportunities to put sort of a carbon lens, or or as an old friend of mine used to say, carbon goggles on. You know, these are ones that we want to be able to put on and take off when we want to think about the business side of agroforestry, which we'll get to shortly. But when we're thinking about the context of um, our USDA conservation programs, I think we want to have that sort of conservation lens on. So the key pro programs we're going to discuss today are the NRCS Environmental Quality Incentives Program, sometimes called EQIP, the NRCS Conservation Stewardship Program called CSP, and the FSA Conservation Reserve Program, um, sometimes called CRP. It's lots of acronyms because it's federal government. Um, We'll go into more detail in each of those, but up front, I also wanted to mention that you know there's a lot of people in the technical assistance provider community who are interested in these conservation benefits of agroforestry as well, particularly in those states where NRCS doesn't currently offer support for agroforestry practices through EQIP or through CSP. And both the Regional Conservation Partnership Program um, and the Conservation Innovation Grant Programs can be really useful. And I just thought I'd mention the RCPP um, because we just had a webinar last week um, that really focused on how you can use that RCPP program for agroforestry work. Um, and the recording should be on our website soon. So let's jump into um, EQIP. Um, I'm gonna have to go a little bit in depth into EQIP to get at the pieces of this that are particularly relevant to climate adaptation and mitigation. So I hope you'll bear with me through that process. Um, NRCS is, I mean, sorry, EQIP is NRCS's flagship conservation program. It's the one most people have heard about. It's providing technical and financial assistance to ag producers and forest landowners to address natural resource concerns. If, like I said, if there isn't a natural resource concern, if there isn't a problem, it's maybe not a good fit for your farm. Um, that financial assistance co covers part of the cost of implementing the conservation practice. It's not gonna cover the entire cost. Um, so that's some general information about EQIP. Um, how does this all work? So NRCS has conservation practice standards, sort of common definitions that describe any conservation practice in the context of their program. So this is not a big picture definition of any practice. Like I think of silvopasture like I have on this slide, right? There are lots of different kinds of silvopasture that are out there. Some that are really focused on the production values of silvopasture. Um, but this conservation practice standard is silvopasture for these conservation purposes. Within that, states can further define a standard with species or spacing that's relevant to their particular location with their particular ecosystem and what kinds of silvopasture will meet um, the conservation needs in a particular state. Um, and not every state is gonna offer every support for every practice. They respond to what's most needed in their state, um, which is something that's talked about in state technical committee meetings, which are open to the public. There's also a nationally defined um, list of resource concerns, those natural resource problems um, that this EQIP program is trying to address. So this is sort of how the pieces of the program fit together. Um, so here are the agroforestry practices, the agroforestry conservation practice standards that go with our five most common temperate agroforestry practices. So silvopasture, managing trees, livestock, and forage production on the same parcel of land, Wind breaks, planting a single or multiple rows of trees or shrubs that redirect or modify the wind um, or have other environmental benefits, 
alley cropping where you're growing a crop within the alley in the alleys between rows of trees, riparian forest buffers where you have natural or planted trees, shrubs, and grasses adjacent to water bodies, and forest farming, the intentional cultivation of non-timber forest products under a, forest, uh, a managed forest canopy. Um, so that's one path into finding support for agroforestry within the EQIP program. We have these conservation practice standards that you can apply and get, get support for, and we'll go into that. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that there are a number of other practices that can be used to either support your agroforestry system or even establish an agroforestry system. And different states take different approaches. Um, some states use these practices rather than the agroforestry practices in supporting agroforestry establishment. So how does this, you know, I'm going on to all these different details and I'm going to continue to for a little bit of these details of the EQIP program, but um, as we mentioned, NRCS uses this conservation planning process to identify problems and opportunities, um, then look at, you know, all these different stages ending up with implementing and evaluating the plan. And so if this conservation planning process identifies natural resource concerns that could be addressed through agroforestry conservation practices, there's an opportunity there to find support for the agroforestry system you might be interested in through EQIP. Um, so getting back to those natural resource concerns, um, when you look at this list of natural resource concerns, I've listed a few here that have particular relevance to climate adaptation and mitigation. So this isn't a complete list. You know, it's a very long, long list. I couldn't fit them all on here, but you'll see um, natural resource concerns like emissions of greenhouse gases that connects very clearly to, to climate mitigation um, or energy efficiency. And on the ad adaptation side, you see a number of, um, you know, erosion concerns related to maybe the more precip intense precipitation events that Gary mentioned, um, concerns related to too much or too little water, or even those related to heat stress and livestock in the form of inadequate livestock shelter. Um, so this guide that I have pictured on the, on the left here um, helps a conservation planner evaluate if the natural resource concerns on a particular farm, on a particular site are severe enough to need a conservation plan. Um, so moving on to the conservation practice standard, and I know this is getting into the nitty gritty, but it's going to connect back to, to uh, climate adaptation and mitigation in a minute. Um, to learn about how your particular state defines a practice, you can dive into the field office technical guide, which provides this detailed information related to the conservation practice standard for your state. Um, and this is what it, what it looks like. So each standard has a definition. Um, has purposes the standard can be used for that relates to those resource concerns and conditions where the practice applies. So this is um, related to land use. So forest land or cropland or grazing land or all lands or something more specialized. The criteria section is requirements. So if you're going to use federal conservation dollars to implement the practice, those are requirements. And then there are additional criteria that are connected to certain purposes. So um, the general criteria are information about design or species selection, like, um, you know, for windbreaks, which I'm picturing here, it's like, here's the maximum height of the windbreak, here are guidelines for making decisions about species. Um, the additional criteria or are those that are, are designed for particular purposes, like I mentioned. So um, these, these additional criteria give that design or species or management guidelines that have to be followed if you're designing for that purpose. So, um, so that's really key to look at. And then the consideration section gives more background information, other information to consider when planning the practice. And then the standard has a lot of other information that can be really helpful if you're thinking to learn more about a practice about um, plans and specifications, operations, maintenance, and then tons of references as well. So I bring up this level of detail um, because for many of the agroforestry practices, there are purposes that include carbon storage and then additional criteria for meeting that carbon storage purpose. So here's the one for windbreaks, right? So there's a purpose that's increased carbon storage in biomass and soils, and then there are ways to adapt your windbreak break design and implementation to get at that conservation purpose. So your additional criteria are planting a windbreak with a larger footprint, um, maintaining your site fertility by minimizing soil disturbance during establishment, um, thinking about carbon storage and, and species selection um, that you're going to plant into that windbreak. So all of these additional criteria for getting at 
um, really increasing the, the climate mitigation benefits of your agroforestry practice. And they, we have this for you know, many of these different practices. Here it is for alley cropping, additional criteria. Here it is for silvopasture. So same kinds of things, Ma you know, maximize. Oh, this, yeah, here's riparian forest buffers. Here's silvopasture um, about stocking rates. So you can see these other considerations, other um, details to use when you're trying to really plan and plant for climate mitigation. Um, so what does this mean? Where, where is this all going? Why do I bring up this level of detail? You know, the Inflation Reduction Act provided significantly more funds for a number of, of NRCS programs, including the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. So in this fiscal year, fiscal year 23, there's $850 million going out to state NRCS offices around the country. Um, and this is specifically related to those practices that, um, that are focused on climate smart agriculture. And so when you look at that list of climate smart ag and forestry mitigation practices, um, I have this list up here on the screen. Um, and on the right here, you see the, the agroforestry category. And again, you see alley cropping, you see forest farming, you see all of the agroforestry practices we've talked about today. Um, and this is a huge opportunity for getting both technical and financial assistance through NRCS. You know, the EQIP program has generally been oversubscribed. Sometimes it's hard, been hard for agroforestry proposals to compete. And there's gonna be a learning curve as field offices learn more about these practices, but it's just an exciting time, an exciting time for agroforestry within NRCS. I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on all of the detailed programs here, but um, I wanna talk briefly about uh, CSP, which really tries to um, help landowners build on existing conservation efforts while strengthening their operations. So CSP is often a really good fit for producers interested in agroforestry. Often um, producers interested in agroforestry are already doing a really great job with conservation and EQIP allows um, financial support for these enhancements that make your conservation practices better. Um, so I'm gonna dive in a little bit more to talking about what this means in an agroforestry context. So this is some of the enhancements for, for this fiscal year. Um, for the conservation stewardship program. These are national enhancements and just like um, with equa practices, states can select which um, enhancements to offer. Um, but there are some ones that jump out here that are related to agroforestry, right? Carbon sequestration and storage as an enhancements opportunity within CSP. Um, another adding food producing trees and shrubs to an agroforestry system. So some key opportunities through CSP as well for advancing our agroforestry goals along with our climate mitigation and adaptation goals. And again, um, this is another program that's received a bunch of funding through the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and when you look at the, the enhancements that are eligible for that IRA funding through NRCS, you see a lot of those agroforestry related enhancements too. So huge opportunities there. Um, CRP, I'll touch briefly on the Farm Service Agency Conservation Reserve Program, which is of course administered through FSA and then technical assistance is provided by NRCS. I feel like CRP is better known in agroforestry context for supporting windbreaks and riparian buffers along with the Conservation Reserve Enhancements Program, which is more focused on water quality. Um, but this too, you know, has has some new opportunities related to climate smart practices. So an incentive payment around those practices that increase carbon sequestration, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that general CRP sign up is open now. It's really, you know, that, in, that incentive is really focused on um, those practices that include establishment of trees and permanent grasses. So an opportunity there for agroforestry as well. Um, so all of that to say, I guess there are a lot of opportunities for establishing trees in your agroforestry systems. Um, if, you're, if you're in the mindset of taking that conservation lens to those programs, um, there's really an opportunity for climate mitigation or carbon sequestration lenses as well. Um, but we know that all these agroforestry systems are part of production systems. You know, they're part of that working landscape. So I think it's also important to talk about the production related programs. Um, 
the upfront. We don't have as many examples of agroforestry producers using these programs, but it's also a really exciting space for, for engagement. So there are programs like the FSA um, Farm Microloans, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I wanted to highlight the FSA Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program and the RMA, the sorry, Risk Management Agency Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program. Since, you know, as Gary showed in his slides, you know, risk management and crop insurance are really an important aspect of, of climate resilience. And it's one where I think producers, especially crops and diversified operations, sometimes feel like they don't have as many options as commodity crop growers. And these, these programs, these two programs can really op offer some opportunities. Um, the non-insured crop program helps with some of those specialty crops and whole farm revenue protection can help um, diversified operations. It's a, it's a program where you get more benefit the more diversified you are. But I think as an agroforestry community, especially among technical assistance providers, um, we can really engage with these programs more to learn how they can be of use to those producers with agroforestry systems. One of the programs I mentioned there, the Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production um, Grant Program, I wanted to call this out. It's open now through the end of the month. It is focused on ur urban ag systems. Um, but specifically mentions um, urban agroforestry, urban orchards, and other food forests in, in the, what they will support in their planning and implementation projects. And those, those planning and implementation projects really do um, support production in a way that we don't see in a lot of USDA programs. So here's a few examples of projects that have been funded in the last couple of years through the, this funding opportunity. Um, just seeing these examples of, of food forests and other um, urban agroforestry systems that have, have been funded. Moving on to processing, um, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunities here for processing. And so I'll just share a few examples of, of programs um, people have used in the past. Um, there are a lot of opportunities around the rural development pro loan programs and grant programs. Um, but I wanted to highlight a couple, a few years ago, we developed some case studies um, related to marketing agroforestry products. Um, and, and recently had a great webinar um, from the Hawaii Ulu Cooperative focused on breadfruit processing um, about how they were able to use the Rural Development Value Added Producer Grant to um, get some sort of innovative approaches to how they are collectively processing their, their breadfruit. Um, you know, there are other examples of, of agroforestry producers who have used these USDA programs to enhance their operations. Um, Integration Acres in Ohio has used a number of different um, USDA programs to advance their operation, but on the processing phase in particular, they use the USDA Rural Development Rural Energy for America program to add solar panels at their processing facility. So thinking creatively about how we use all these different USDA programs to advance our, our goals in agroforestry. Um, next, talking briefly about the aggregation and distribution phase, you know, here, this is one where I think there's a lot of interest from the agroforestry community right now in, okay, great, we're all producing these small quantities of these interesting nut crops, um, fruit crops, how do, we, how do we market them better? And so how do we better take advantage of, I think in particular, the community facilities loans and grants, some of the on-farm farm storage facility loans, um, and some of these other options. I wanted to highlight briefly the specialty crop block grants because, you know, again, so many of these agroforestry systems, and I bet Eric is going to talk about this soon, um, are using some of these exciting woody crops, right, that we have some information about but need more work on sort of how do we aggregate and distribute them. And so the specialty crop block grants have really done an incredible job in supporting um, often farmer led, uh, it's too strong to call it research, but work on. Um, you know, such a range of key topics. So wine cap mushrooms, goji berries, pawpaw industry, dealing with um, disease issues, pecans. So really getting into some of these key topics. And that's a key resource where farms can come together and apply to these specialty crop block, or, or sorry, to the specialty crop grants offered by their state ag agencies, which is funded by the Ag Marketing Service, um, to really advance some specialty crop questions related to aggregation and distribution. And so finally, you know, I, I think we all want to think about the consumer end of where all of our products are going in our agroforestry systems. And there are a number of different um, 
resources and programs there around thinking about that end user and how we can encourage their interest in agroforestry systems or just the crops created in agroforestry systems or just markets in general, a key piece of sort of the puzzle of putting together an, a business plan, um, especially when you're adding something new like agroforestry. So just to wrap up, you know, USDA has a number of programs that support agroforestry work, particularly around climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, but these programs don't always use the agro word agroforestry. And sometimes you have to do a little bit of, of, of digging to find how agroforestry fits in. Um, and I think, you know, I have learned a lot from farmers and agroforestry working groups and other networks that are really thinking about innovative approaches to USDA programs and that's work that needs to continue. And here at the National Agroforestry Center, we'd be excited to talk more with people who have ideas related to, to all of these topics. So I'm gonna end there and um, we'll see if we have enough time for questions um, and then transition to the next speaker too. Thank you so much, Kate and Gary. That was just incredible information. It's amazing to see all the different tools that are out there all in one place from planning and design to maintenance to implementation to marketing. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions that came through the chat and I'm just gonna go through a few of them before we get to our next session. Um, first question, will your slides be available? Yes. This recording, um, this presentation is being recorded and it will be posted to the ATRA uh, YouTube channel. And we'll also uh, be saving all the resources in the chat and we can send them out to all participants. Um, one of the questions that came through was, how adaptable are any of these programs to tiny scale, such as in cities outside of the urban ag grant? Yeah, that is such a great question. It's actually one that USDA is working on really hard. I think, you know, uh, the 2018 Farm Bill created that Office of Innovative Ag and Urban Production. And in addition to the grants that I mentioned, they also have some really exciting opportunities like um, the FSA has always had county committees or farm committees that you can apply to be part of and join. And they do a lot of great work in, um, in working with the FSA office in a particular county or, or state, they now have urban committees. So this is right now on a pilot basis. There's about, I think, 13 of them across the country, but they're looking to expand it going forward. So that's one place to engage and really think about how can the FSA programs be used on that urban micro community scale. I'd say as well, NRCS is doing a lot of work to think about how its programs, so I talked a lot about EQIP, right? How EQIP can work at a, at a urban scale. So they're doing work around, okay, what would an urban version of any of those agroforestry practices look like? And so they're developing conservation practice standards and scenarios that fit that urban context. So definitely resources there, but it's new. It's something that NRCS is, and, and USDA as a whole is learning more about as it goes. So um, definitely encourage you to reach out to your local service center and, and ask them those questions because they're looking to answer them. That's great. Thank you. And we just have time for one more question. We got a question um, from a participant saying, I live in an area that's pretty dry with annual precipitation of only 12 inches annually. If I plant trees next to my crops, how much water is being pulled or taken away from my crop? So I think um, this is a question that I get often being in California in a dryland environment. So I guess I would just ask, are there any tools for agroforestry in dryland environments in particular? I can take a first shot at that and you can follow up, Kate. Um, you know, a really good tool on trying to estimate some of that water competition is, is challenging and it's it's pretty species dependent, but that's a starting point is to look at what are the water requirements for species and kind of and their rooting patterns and kind of determine if there is going to be a bit of competition. Um, and it does get down to kind of species selection in those dry land environments. Uh, and there are some examples and we've got some coming out through our, our uh, grant program that are in more dry land environments to kind of show what are some of those possibilities. I'll just add that, you know, again, we have so much to learn in agroforestry and honestly, internationally, um, agroforestry is often practiced in dryland environments, right? And so we know that people have been able to find those tree and crop combinations 
that work. And so some of it is that further work that's needed and testing and experimentation that's needed around what our, our tree and crop combinations that are most effective are. And as Gary said, we're really doing that now through um, some outreach projects, just trying to learn from farmers and what's worked for them. But there's a lot of great work that's needed. And there's a great, I'll just mention that um, for folks who are in the Southwest, there's a working group, an agroforestry working group called the Southwest Agroforestry Action um, Coalition that, that tries to think through these things. And it's a, com a great combination of farmers, um, researchers, extension folks, NRCS folks all working together because it's definitely a topic we want to learn more about. Well, thank you so much. That's all the time we have, but um, there are so many more questions coming through. But um, thank you so much for taking the time today, Kate and Gary. That was absolutely just so informative. Um, and yeah, I look forward to staying connected with you both um, to work on agroforestry initiatives. Uh, so we're going, we, we are gonna get right into our next session. Um, but first, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Western SARE, the Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, SARE, advances innovations that improve profitability, stewardship, and quality of life in American agriculture by investing in groundbreaking research and education. SARE's grant programs include the involvement of farmers and ranchers from inception to finish, and currently, SARE's Farmer to Rancher program is accepting proposals. Western SARE also provides a diverse collection of education resources, books, fact sheets, bulletins, curricula, multimedia presentations, and more. And many of these resources are about agroforestry. So visit westernsare.org to learn more. Thank you so much, Western SARE. And with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Eric Tomesmeyer, who we are so honored to have with us today. Eric has studied, practiced, and promoted perennial agriculture for almost three decades. He's a senior fellow with the Global Evergreening Alliance, and he is director of the Perennial Agriculture Institute. Eric is a former appointed lecturer at Yale University and former senior research researcher at Project Drawdown. He is the author of one of my favorite books, The Carbon Farming Solution, a global toolkit of perennial crops and regenerative ag agriculture practices for climate mitigation, climate change mitigation and food security. That was my spark book that got me into agroforestry. So thank you so much for being here, Eric. And uh, for our participants, we will have about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So please write your questions in the chat. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thanks very much. And um, it's great to be here. I've been a fan of ATRA for about 25 years. I used to run a small agriculture library. So we were in great touch with um, ATRA and had lots of ATRA publications. And um, it's also uh, it's an honor to be here uh, with Kate and Gary, who have been so incredibly helpful um, uh, in the agroforestry books that I'm uh, working on writing right now. So. Um, uh, with that said, I'll just go ahead and pop in on um, on the screen here, and we're going to just kind of walk through the broad picture of um, agroforestry and its role in mitigating uh, um, climate change. And I'll say that I, I began this journey uh, in what became the Carbon Farming Solution book by looking at the sort of acre by acre potential of different practices to sequester carbon. Um, and then when I worked at Project Drawdown, I really got my perspective broadened to look at um, emissions reduction and growing more food on the land we have to help reduce deforestation and looking at diet change and food waste reduction and the whole bigger picture. Today we'll be sort of drilling down to looking at the production end of things mostly. So, um, but happy to answer questions about, about any and all of those. So first let's look at emissions from agriculture. This is global, not US, um, but globally it's about a third of humanity's emissions are coming from our food system in one way or another. Some of it is from deforestation, which is not just a tropical issue, but like Canada is having a huge issue with emissions from deforestation for farming right now. Um, we have quite a lot from agricultural production proper, which is where we'll focus today. Um, uh, a number in the supply chain that have to do with um, 
um, transportation and processing and refrigeration, things like that. And then there are some end of life issues. So uh, it's a big piece of the problem. It's definitely not just the case that fossil fuels are are the only driver of of, um, of climate change. The agriculture uh, sector is a big is a big piece of that. And I love um, John Foley, who uh, who is the director of our Project Rada and now has this lovely way of talking about this. He says, imagine if climate change was like a sink that's overflowing. Um, if the, uh, if your sink is overflowing and water is coming out and it's all over the floor, the first thing you do is turn off the faucet. That's reducing emissions. So we have to turn off the faucet. The second thing you do is you mop up all the extra water. That's what carbon sequestration is, removing extra carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So it doesn't make any sense to start mopping without turning off the faucet because it just doesn't work, especially because in this case, the bucket that we can put that water in is only so big. Um, but uh, but also if you turn off the faucet and you don't mop up the mess, you still have a huge mess. So you really have to do both of those things together. Um, so uh, let's look a little bit about what that looks like uh, on the farm itself. There are these other approaches, as I was mentioning, we can reduce food waste. I think in the US we're at about 40% of the food that we um, purchase here is never ends up being consumed, which is a huge travesty and is one angle, a way to slice the, the challenge. Um, changing diets away from foods that have high emissions uh, and or high land use per, per unit of production. Um, uh, uh, intensification is growing more food on the land we have, whether that's uh, making cropland produce more, for example, by adding trees in, in agroforestry systems, which can increase the overall productivity, uh, or by taking, you know, rooftops and urban lots and putting them into food production that aren't now growing food. We got to re reduce our emissions and sequester carbon and change the supply chain. This is kind of the overall picture. Um, and uh, again, this is a global image, not uh, US, but the, the worst uh, source of emissions globally is from the digestion of ruminant livestock. And certainly that's a big contributor in the United States as well, despite what some people may want to tell you. Um, and manure is also a very big deal, manure from manure lagoons, but also manure um, applied to crop fields uh, at the wrong time or in the wrong um, uh, amount and manure on pasture are all serious sources of um, of emissions and synthetic fertilizer in the US. I think the synthetic fertilizer is higher, the rice production is lower, the livestock ones are a bit lower, um, but all of these are important sources of emissions. So we wanna look and see where agroforestry gives us an opportunity to reduce those emissions and it gives us quite a few such opportunities. Um, there are a whole range of techniques we can use to reduce those. Um, emissions um, and we'll get into the agroforestry related ones <coughs> excuse me in a little bit um, but this is just to say there are lots of ways to do it and anybody who tells you that there's only one way to um, to uh, do mitigation in agriculture just isn't paying attention to the science because we have this incredible huge toolkit it's really it's quite exciting quite fascinating um, so carbon sequestration, people are now very familiar with this notion that, uh, you know, plants breathe in carbon dioxide. They they break the carbon and the oxygen apart. Uh, the oxygen is returned to the atmosphere so we can breathe and the carbon is made into all kinds of amazing compounds in the plants. Um, some of it ends up in the uh, soil organic matter um, quickly or slowly in various ways. Um, uh, and while much of what is drawn down is re-released to the atmosphere, some of it will stay in soil organic matter if you're using practices that encourage that to, to, to maintain or grow. And of course, it's also present in the above ground biomass. And the limitation of a lot of the conversation in the U.S. about carbon sequestration is it's really been looking at soil carbon sequestration, which is wonderful and important, but it totally misses the above ground dimension of carbon, the per, the carbon held in the perennial biomass of trees and other um, woody plants, and also in the below ground biomass in the roots of, of, of various kinds of perennials too. So um, there are lots of opportunities to hold more carbon 
uh, in our soils and biomass agriculture. And of course, it brings other benefits. This isn't going to be a new idea to any of you either, that uh, increasing organic matter in the soil builds your water holding capacity, makes you better able to handle droughts and also slow the runoff from storms and so on. There's even a tiny increase in the ability of soils to increase methane. Um, uh, but here's the trick is that not all practices are equal when it comes to sequestering carbon. Some sequester much more than others. Uh, and the key thing there that I found is the more trees, the more carbon practices that have more trees in them have much more carbon. And the higher the density of trees, the more carbon. So the question is how to do that in such a way that doesn't reduce food production or profitability for the farm. Uh, and it's also the case that it's different between different climates where some practices um, uh, sequester more carbon in one climate than another. Generally speaking, more humid climates within the United States, more humid climates are going to do uh, more than drier climates. And generally speaking, um, as you go north, there's more in soil and less in above ground biomass. And as you go south, um, the reverse is true. You see more in above ground biomass and less uh, in the soils. And I'll just say that some of the most powerful practices that do the most, the most powerful practices on a per acre basis are currently really limited to the tropics. Um, where people by and large have done the least to cause climate change and are the most affected by it. Um, um, so um, um, uh, kudos to Hawaii and San Diego and South Florida for being able to implement some of these most powerful practices. Now there are drawbacks to carbon sequestration and people don't like to talk about this either. The first thing is that it only may continue for a couple of decades, 20, 50 years, something like that. And then it slows down to almost nothing. There are some tricks to get around that, but generally speaking, it's going to fill up. Um, um, and it doesn't last forever. Uh, it can be lost. Uh, where, should your climate shift to a much drier climate, that carbon held in soil and biomass will be lost. Even if there's just a really bad drought, you can lose a lot. Um, fires, a return to tillage, various other kinds of things um, can happen that mean that carbon is lost. So um, it's not as permanent as reducing emissions, but it is, but we can't get there without it. It's super important. And finally, it's very hard to predict and it's very expensive to test. So I, there are lots of developments coming down the pike people are working on to be able to do that, but we're not quite there yet. And that has been a real challenge in accessing certain kinds of finance um, for these practices. So there's lots of tools here, lots of tools in carbon sequestration, just as with emissions reduction, there's better ways to grow annual crops, including agroforestry practices. There are better ways to raise livestock, including agroforestry practices. They're shifting to perennial crops often associated with perennials. And then there's a set of sustainable land management practices um, also. Um, so let's see, oh, here's Jono's farm. Hey, Jono. <laughs> um, uh, wherever we can, if we can shift some or all of production into perennials, that's gonna do a better job um, in terms of carbon sequestration, broadly speaking. Uh, and I was just part of a paper that came out last year on, um, policy pathways for perennial agriculture in the United States. So we start, we really looked at a, a range of different kinds of strategies that people could, could implement to perennialize as much as possible with the understanding that um, we're not going to perennialize all of it and we don't have to, but we can think about certain lands that are especially vulnerable to erosion, for example, that would be priorities. Um, uh, and uh, and where things can be perennialized, they they should be in, in terms of in terms of carbon. That's per, almost always the case. So we have this suite of agroforestry practices, um, uh, uh, which have been talked about already. There's combining them with annual crops, combining with other perennial crops, combining with the uh, grazing systems, and then sort of a miscellaneous category. Um, so let's talk about some ways. Uh, uh, these are compatible generally with better annual cropping practices and better livestock production practices. So you can mix agroforestry in some of these things. We like to see less tillage. We like to see cover crops. Um, we like to see nutrient management. Uh, we like to see organic production. 
Um, there's a whole range, a whole set of better production practices for annual crops, again, many of which you can combine trees with, but not all of which, um, like uh, aerial spraying of herbicide for conventional no-till is not a good combination with trees that tends to kill, especially establishing trees. So um, I like to look at not just the carbon sequestration, but really across the board here, we could look at like cover crops, for example, not only do they sequester carbon, but they also reduce some nitrous oxide um, emissions if you're using um, um, nitrogen fixing cover crops. Um, if you're uh, looking at reduced tillage, you're not only sequestering carbon, but you're reducing tractor emissions because plowing is one of the heaviest jobs. Um, that requires a lot of uh, fuel. We're reducing nitrous oxide and reducing methane a little bit. So there are these multiple impacts happening from these practices. And I think if we look only at carbon sequestration or only at nitrous oxide reduction, we're missing this sort of full picture. I've also got intensification in here to show if they're increasing production um, in some way. So let's talk about perennializing uh, our annual crops. First, there's a set of protective systems that the primary reason we do them is um, uh, is to protect our crops or protect uh, natural resources. So windbreaks, pollinator hedgerows, riparian buffers, the contour um, plantings, these are all examples of systems that leave most of our annual cropland intact but start to bring some trees in around the edges. This is a great sort of gateway drug to further agroforestry. Um, uh, and then we have systems that really bring the trees into the middle of the cropping field. And this is, um, I've been learning a lot about this lately. I'm actually about to plant a bunch of trees this way, uh, in, in my field this way, in my new farm this year. Um, and this is really still sort of a new practice for U.S. farms in many ways. Um, people have been doing this all around the world for thousands of years. Uh, uh, it was practiced here in crop fields. Uh, at the time of colonization by indigenous farmers, but really, practically speaking, this is a new concept for 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 the great majority of U.S. farmers. And um, the trick is to get the right combination of trees and crops, um, um, uh, the right spacing, the right density, um, trees that'll be friendly to the crops, crops that'll be friendly to the trees. Um, so it's not just sticking a bunch of random trees out in the middle of your field. It has to work ergonomically for your machinery. Um, in many cases, what seems to work well is if the seasonality of the crops are different, like in for California, for example, um, we can look to Mediterranean France where they grow deciduous trees, timber trees with winter cereals like wheat um, or rye because they're active at different times of the year, they're photosynthesizing mostly at different times of the year, they're occupying the same space, but not really at the same time. So there's less competition for light. There's also less competition for water in certain ways. So that's a really interesting um, model. We can move to fully perennial crops like fruit trees, of course, um, things we already have markets for like peaches or new crops like pawpaws. Um, uh, we can even move to uh, what are now, um, here's John again, what are now um, um, specialty crops like nuts that may over time actually become new bulk commodity staple, uh, staple products for, for, for um, protein and carbohydrates and fats and so on. Uh, right now, these nuts are really mostly um, specialty products and we are in the early stages of development of of perennial grains, uh, we, we have Kernza, which is um, not as productive uh, as wheat, but can be fully profitable because it has a great market and a good price right now. And sorghum is close on its heels for development. Excuse me. So um, this is, I think, when we combine perennial grains with, with trees will really be at the very highest standard for what um, <laughs> excuse me, row crop production could look like in terms of carbon sequestration. This is what some of what I'll be doing in our backfield here over time. Uh, and then we have multi-layered systems like the, 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 the home food forest, the urban food forest, uh, and other kinds of multi-strata systems. One example I love is Good Life Farm in upstate New York, where they have rows of fruit trees like apples and, and pears and some peaches. 
And between them, they have rows of perennial crops like various kinds of berries and asparagus. They have poultry rotating all through. Um, it's quite uh, it's quite elegant. And then all of that is marketed through an on-farm hard cider mill. So there's a high value um, market for those products as well. It's a really interesting example. These these are sort of the systems with the highest density of trees and the highest levels of carbon in many ways. Um, if you're combining trees with some other kind of perennial crop, that's really a very powerful uh, combination. And we have, as, as, as may have been mentioned earlier, the woody perennial polyculture research um, uh, that's uh, being undertaken um, in the Midwest is very exciting, looking at combinations of things like chestnuts and hazelnuts and various kinds of fruit crops and other things. Um, so really beginning to build out the research base for um, what are these kinds of systems, which are, as I mentioned, so common in the tropics, uh, widespread in the tropics, something like 250 million acres of these kinds of systems in the product in the tropics right now. Um, uh, it's time for us to catch up and follow the lead of those great tropical farmers and see if we can make those systems work here commercially. Um, we can see that there's not much to be said for methane reduction from these systems, but there's outstanding soil carbon sequestration and sequestration in the biomass. Some of them increase yields, some of them decrease yields, uh, like Kernza yields less than wheat right now, not forever. Uh, and there are some nitrous oxide reductions with these systems also. So let's talk livestock for a minute. Of course, nothing has gotten more airtime, I think, than, than manage grazing systems, improve grazing systems for, um, for carbon sequestration in particular. And there are indeed uh, some very nice carbon sequestration impacts that happen from these kinds of systems. Some of the global potential has been oversold, but as a farm practice, I, I, I don't have a single critique. I think it's marvelous. Um, and um, what we haven't talked about, there's a couple of interesting um, uh, uh, other dimensions here. One is that we are reducing some emissions with this kind of system when the animals are getting more tender forage um, because they're being moved around a lot. Um, that reduces methane emissions a little bit. And when you restore degraded pastures, um, which this is a very nice practice uh, for doing, uh, you reduce the nitrous oxide emissions from the urine of livestock. So there are some bonuses there. The challenge here is that over time, your soils do become saturated with carbon over a number of decades, and then you're right back to your animals being a source of emissions again. Um, uh, and uh, a really interesting way to get around that is silvopasture, adding trees to those systems. Uh, the trees themselves increase the amount of carbon in the soil, plus they add the above ground uh, um, biomass carbon. So I think we're looking at three to five times more carbon per acre, roughly, from silvopasture compared to, um, to improved pasture alone. Uh, but also, eventually, of course, the soil becomes saturated in a silvopasture, and the above ground biomass does true. The trees really stop growing at a certain point. And what you can do at that point, which is a sort of a unique offering, is you can then cut down some of those trees. And if you use them in long lived products like uh, building a house or building furniture or building musical instruments, then that carbon is held in the life or bioplastics for that matter. The carbon is held. Uh, in those wood products for the life of those wood products. And then if you replant trees or if your trees are the re-sprouting type and they re-sprout, you set the clock back on saturation again. So to my mind, this is the only way that I know of to um, get around the issue of carbon saturation in, um, uh, in grazing systems. Uh, that is scientifically verified. There, there can be some continued... Uh, uh, capture and holding of carbon in grassland soils, even after saturation, uh, but it's not held tightly at all. And in, in, in a drought or whatever, which we increasingly are looking at increasing uh, um, erratic weather and longer dry periods in much of our nation's grazing lands, um, that carbon is quickly lost, so it's not very securely held. Um, these trees can also, of course, provide other benefits to the livestock. Um, I'm doing another book with uh, Interlace Commons right now on tree fodder, 
Um, and many of the trees that uh, you can feed the leaves to livestock also reduce methane quite impressively. So um, uh, that's so there are some um, um, uh, emissions reduction, uh, extra bonus emissions reductions from there as well. There are a few herbaceous forages that do that as well, like uh, birds. So tree foil is high in the right kind of tannins. Um, uh, longleaf plantain is another one, but the tree fodders are a really great way to do that. And also tree fodder is a great way to get through long dry periods when grass dries up, especially if you have cool season pastures, it can be a really big um, contributor. Um, so uh, we could talk more about that in questions that people like. So here you can see again, there is um, some of these practices have good soil sequestration. You get the biomass and the silvopasture based systems. Um, uh, uh, and there are some very minor reductions to methane and nitrous oxide as well. Um, the tree fodder um, can give you something like 20% reduction of methane. So not enough, but great, but a great bonus and certainly something we want to take advantage of. Um, uh, let's see, this is sustainable land management. Mostly these are amendments that aren't really related to agroforestry. So we'll just move on from that. Um, uh, I, I really don't think that there's any one practice that everyone should do. I don't think there's any one best practice. I do think the agroforestry practices have a lot to be said for them. Um, but I really, I, I believe that the idea is to provide farmers with uh, as, as broad a toolkit as we can. And, uh, and then farmers, uh, perhaps with some assistance, are able to um, select the, the practices that are right for their farm, for their operation, for their markets, for their personal management style, for their land, uh, you know, field by field and so on. So, um, so here's an example where, um, this was a design I did for a farm in, in Missouri, where, uh, it was highly eroded, very, very eroded, very terrible gullying problem. So a small amount of the farm was virtually flat and that gave us lots of options including some agroforestry options but some um uh the the only place where it was appropriate to grow annual crops without agroforestry systems on the intermediate slopes um we were able to to look at planting trees fairly wide apart two to three times the uh, mature height of the trees and then crop in between them uh, was appropriate and certainly we could do grazing and silvopasture there. But once you got to the steeper slopes, uh, it was really perennial crops and silvopasture were the best options. So even within a farm, uh, uh, different slopes or other characteristics, whether it's different soil types or or, or uh, moisture levels or something like that can um, can impact what are the right practices for, again, for a given farmer. Your land tenure is going to have a lot to do that if you don't have long-term access to the land uh, that's going to mitigate against uh, doing agroforestry practices um, and everything else that um, we're talking about before in terms of market access, um, 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 USDA programs that you're eligible for and so on all will play into that. So just if you're looking to read more, um, the um, I wrote a little guide for Project Drawdown called Farming Our Way Out of the Climate Crisis that provides sort of a global overview of agricultural mitigation and all these issues. The Carbon Farming book uh, certainly covers the biosequestration in, in, in quite a bit of detail and, and quite a lot about perennial crops. Uh, and then I am doing these two guides for, for Interlaced Commons with Megan Giro. Um, uh, one is a guide to alley cropping systems, uh, and the other is on tree fodder. So with that, I will uh, stop and be prepared for questions now or later, whenever is the right time. Thank you so much, Eric. That was so informative. Um, and we do have some questions that have come through the chat. Um, and I have some questions. First of all, I just like to say, I really like your holistic approach to thinking about all of this. and. I, I really do think it's important to not only think about sequestering carbon, but also things like, like you said, like methane reduction and just emissions reduction in general. Um, and, you know, like anything, it's just so important to think about this and everything in a holistic way. Um, and I, I also really appreciated the fact that you talked about how even in agroforestry systems or in any agricultural system, uh, carbon can be lost after it's sequestered. And um, 
Yeah, as you mentioned, one of the ways to ensure that carbon stays stored for a longer time is to make sure that the above ground biomass of trees is being used for things like building materials or furniture, things that aren't going anywhere. Um, so I did want to ask, what's what's your opinion on using trees uh, as biofuels, things like that, that will be burned? Sure. Um, well, uh, broadly speaking, uh, there is this notion that 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 um, burning biomass is carbon neutral, and it's really very much not the case. It's actually when you burn it, it's worse than coal. And over time, if and only if the place you cut it from regrows, um, it can eventually become uh, uh, better than coal and actually can eventually become carbon neutral. But it depends on the issue there is uh, how long the rotation is. So in like northern Canada and Siberia, it takes 500 years of regrowth for it to uh, become better, to become uh, carbon neutral. Whereas in agroforestry systems where you're cutting it every year, it only takes one year and then you're ahead of the game. So it completely depends on how you're growing the biomass in terms of its climate impact. And should there be someday uh, bioenergy capture with, um, uh, 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 sorry, biomass burning that really captures that uh, carbon, which we really do not have in any real way, that, that could be um, a very different equation at that point, although there's still only so much biomass available. Um, uh, uh, to do that. So, so mostly I'm not a huge fan of that. And uh, it was real disappointment when I learned about that. Yeah, that is really important to know and to talk about. Um, and, you know, that also brings me to the question of biochar. What is your opinion on that? Sure. Biochar is, is, I, I was, I, it almost went there in my train of thought is an example of burning uh, biomass where you do end up capturing a lot of that carbon is sort of a form of bioenergy carbon capture and storage. Um, uh, and um, I think uh, in terms of applying it on farms, uh, getting it in, in the soils that have a low cation exchange capacity, like my very, very sandy farm, uh, it can make a really big difference in reducing leaching and improving carbon sequestration and providing some long-lived organic matter in soils that are very resistant to letting organic matter build up. And also interestingly, feeding uh, biochar to livestock um, helps to reduce some of the um, emissions from manure. So I think while it was sort of wildly oversold for a period of time, um, there really is some some very intriguing potential. Again, we can't provide the amount of biomass to biochar that would be required for it to be the world's biggest climate solution, but it can be a very a part of a balanced breakfast of mitigation. I actually did an article for Scientific American on this a year or two ago where we looked at this sort of global demand for biomass. So many solutions, climate solutions want biomass, and they can't all have as much as they want or you end up cutting down lots of forests to make that happen, which would be a different kind of climate disaster. So um, uh, yeah, I think it was called the, the battle for biomass or something like that. That That is really interesting. And I like how you said um, part of a balanced breakfast of climate change mitigation tools. Yeah, and it's important to think about that. There are so many different tools in our toolbox. We're gonna have different ones that are more useful for different contexts and um, yeah, important to know about all of the different options. Um, so switching gears, there are some questions coming through. Um, one asked, could you talk more about some of the species for tree fodder? Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, there's sort of like a, what, what we've been looking at, what Megan and I have been looking at in this book is what are the species that um, are very productive, are adaptable, um, re-sprout really well when you cut them, uh, and have high protein and digestibility. Uh, and the key, the sort of um, the most important uh, big species for most of the United States would be willows, um, poplars and cottonwoods, mulberry. Um, oh, let's see, uh, black locusts, although a little bit less uh, on the digestibility, it's not as digestible. Um, uh, then there are 
many, many, many others. Um, some of the ashes, although our ashes are having these um, insect and disease problems that make them not a super great choice, unfortunately. Um, those would be probably the key ones to start with for most people in Hawaii. They would be there would be a different set in Florida. There would be a different set. Um, and uh, we've been looking at some of the species for the um, uh, the southwest as well, where um, there's a native Lucina, for example, um, which is a tropical species of tree fodder, which is out the world's most widely grown tree fodder species. But we have Lucina retusa, which is actually hardy to USDA zone seven or even six for some varieties. Wow. That's a Texas native. That seems like a very promising um, candidate. I'll be growing some here this year to see if I can find any that'll survive the winter. That's great. I love Lucina. I um, farmed in Paraguay for a bit, and that was oh, yeah. my favorite great. fodder great. tree down there. But it's great to hear that in temperate climates, it's appropriate too in some contexts. Um, let's see, lots more questions coming through. Um, what agroforestry systems exist or are being developed for dry areas to reduce wind erosion and evaporative water loss? Sure. Well, I can say that it, 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 temperate wise, there's a lot of silvopasture being done around the world in dry places um, and lots of wind breaks and stuff. The issue, as I think was mentioned before, in, in alley cropping systems is you don't want your trees and crops to compete with each other for water. Um, that's the key thing. So we, we looked around a little bit at where there are commercial scale agroforestry systems, you know, broadly um, in temperate climates and what the, what the sort of rainfall limit is. And it's clear that with 20 inches and over, people are doing lots and lots of it. There were some examples of places with as little as like 12 or 14 inches of rainfall a year. Um, in certain parts of Mediterranean Europe, for example, um, but I without irrigation and then with irrigation, people can do whatever they, you know, whatever their sustainable use of water um, allows. I just don't, um, uh, uh, I don't have a lot of great examples of um, uh, uh, mixing the trees and crops in very dry places because the water competition issue is a big deal. So um, as as Gary and Kate were saying, that's going to be a matter of us of a bunch of experimentation to see what works in the really drier parts of the US because you don't want to. The shade is a benefit to the crops in dry, hot places, but the water is a problem. So it's just going to be a matter of fine tuning that and figure out what that really looks like here. I, I don't have great answers for that yet. Yeah, it's such a good point. It, it is going to be a matter of fine tuning it and just figuring out the appropriate tree crop combinations for different areas. I And like you said, the shade benefit is huge. Um, yeah, re reducing evaporation and, and just providing that um, reduction in stress is so beneficial. Um, I know I studied uh, grapevines and olive tree alloc cropping systems and in dryland environments, that was a really, really great tree crop combination, but it's, yeah, like you said, it's going to totally depend. And um, I, I'm hopeful for more research on that soon. Um, let's see, we have a question about Paradise Lot. Sure. Um, someone said, I found Paradise Lot to be very inspiring when I read it a few years ago. Can you update us with additional information about that project after so many years? Sure. I, I This was our, our home garden, which was a sort of an urban food forest kind of version of agroforestry. Uh, well, I, we lived there for 17 years and it did great. I just moved to a new farm. The other half of that farm moved to their own, or that home moved to their own farm as well. And we've passed it on to a new group of folks who are really excited and bringing it forward um, in some really cool new direction. So it's in good hands and some of those trees are, are very large and fruiting really well. It's doing great. So that's great. That's great that's to the, hear. That's the short update. Let's see another question. Trees take a long time to grow, which can be discouraging because it takes so long to see a return on in investment. Um, are there any ideas that you have financial, practical, or biological for overcoming this bar barrier to adoption, which I know is one of the main barriers to adoption? Yeah. Well, I, one answer is to take advantage of the many wonderful USDA programs that help with tree establishment <laughs> that Kate was talking about, um, which can really help to get through that, um, to overcome that. 
uh, barrier and to not just think about the, as she was saying, to not just think about the agroforestry ones, but the, the much broader suite of tree establishment um, 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 uh, practices that are out there. Um, uh, another is to think about, there's this idea that's coming out of Brazil um, with the, um, a whole system of agroforestry coming out of there, which is slipping my mind. Somebody can put it in the chat, I'm sure. Um, Centropic ag? Centropic ag, right, which yeah. is to, to really think about having crops at every stage of the way. So along with your big long-term trees, planting other things that are going to make money in the short medium, long, and very long term to have sort of a succession along those lines. Much as we think about that seasonally uh, on a direct market farm that you want to have something to take to the farmer's market every week, we, just thinking about that successionally that we want to have um, something making money for us all the way, uh, all the way along. Um, and actually alley cropping is a great strategy for um, and, and, and silver pasture, for that matter, are great ways to make money from the land while waiting for those trees, money from livestock, money from annual crops, whatever it might be, so that you're not um, uh, stuck waiting for fruit to start or nuts to start, or even worse, for high value timber, which can be 60 or 70 years. Um, most of us would like income before 60 or 70 years. Yeah. Um, so another example of, of that is um, some folks are planting um, poplars between um, walnuts and oaks. So you wait a long time for that high value walnut and oak, but meanwhile, you get and get some money from poplars after maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, so uh, I think there's lots of ways people are thinking about that right now. In Europe, a lot of people are doing berries like gooseberries and currants while they're waiting for those other trees to come along. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Just allowing the system to evolve over time. Um, and yeah, and looking for ways to generate income at every single step of the process, which could mean changing your crops every few years as your amount of shade increases and changes and the amount of competition might change. So that's that's a really, really good point that we just have to be aware that succession is part of the process of an agroforestry system evolving. Yeah. It would be nice if there was a better finance system if somebody wanted to step up and really provide, if a private organization wanted to step up and provide loans for people to do that would be great. And that is happening in some other parts of the world. I'm not aware of that happening at any kind of huge scale here just yet. Yeah, I have heard of some um, companies uh, starting to talk about that. And so, yeah, hopefully that will be a, a new economic model that we can take advantage of soon. Um, but, you know, succession or sorry, uh, land tenure, um, like you mentioned, is another really important part of that. A lot of times farmers don't want to invest in planting trees on land that they don't know what will, will be theirs in 10 or 15 years. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that there's necessarily a solution to that, but do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I mean, I'm not an expert on these things at all. Globally, the trend is is larger and larger farms and less and less small farms. And that is the opposite of what's needed for mitigation. Smaller farms have been shown to produce more per acre than larger farms. So for the intensification gain, the growing more on the land we have, we actually wanna be encouraging more and more smaller farms instead of more and more larger ones. So I think um, policy-wise, we may be headed in the wrong direction on that. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good point. Well, we um, have just, a few more minutes for questions. So I'm just going to read through a few of these. Um, one is in terms of greenhouse gas impact, isn't forest management going to be more important than incorporating trees into agriculture? Aren't the agriculture agricultural impacts of agroforestry a drop in the bucket? Interesting, interesting question. Well, there are lots of sectors of civilization, and each sector of civilization needs to get its act together around climate change to move towards net zero emissions by 2050. So um, agriculture has to get its act together and forestry has to get its act together, too. That's what I would say. I think that the the total amount of timber is still going to be much bigger from forests than from farms, um, uh, for sure. And uh, and that's great, but I no, I think um, um, agricultural land actually has quite a bit of potential because 
forests are already are already closer to their maximum carbon potential and agricultural land has lost so much of their carbon we're at about um most farmland globally has lost about half of its carbon from the soil and all of its carbon from above ground biomass so it can regain uh close to what it initially had before it was cleared for agriculture plus whatever we can get away with in biomass whereas forests are already closer to their maximum potential so maintaining forests is super important to maintain the carbon stock and improving forest management to increase carbon sequestration important um, but actually because farmland has been so much more badly treated in terms of carbon than forest there is more potential to um to um soak up and store extra carbon there on a per acre basis yeah that's such a good point and and we do still need to produce food for we do have an to eat. increasing population yes. so might as yes. well do it in a way that um is car carbon beneficial yeah well, thank you so much. This has been such an incredible session. We have so many more questions coming through the chat. So, um, you know, I would just say to our participants, um, reach out to us at NCAT. Um, you can always email me um, and I'll do my best to answer questions and connect you to the right resources. That's what we're here for. Um, but I, Eric, I want to thank you again. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us today. Um, that was just wonderful.
Well, I guess it's one now, so we can get started. I am so excited for this next portion of today's conference, where we'll be talking with two incredible agroforestry practitioners who are walking the walk and putting all of these amazing principles into action. So I am very honored to introduce Ellie Honan, the production manager at Coastal Roots Farm in San Diego, California. Coastal Roots Farm is a nonprofit Jewish community farm and education center that practices organic farming, provides farm-based education, and fosters community. Ellie has worked at Coastal Roots Farm for over seven years and oversees the farm's vegetable production, laying hen flocks, compost operation, and agroforestry operation. Ellie began farming over a decade ago while working and traveling in East Africa, and she has a passion for regenerative agriculture and the communities built around it. And Ellie is also a dear friend of mine, and she and I used to work at Coastal Roots Farm together, so I can personally attest that Ellie is a genius at what she does, and she truly is a woman who speaks the language of the land. Um, and over time, she has meticulously designed and dialed in the systems and processes at Coastal Roots Farm, and it's just truly an incredible system to behold. So um, thank you, Ellie, for being here. And we also are so honored to have with us Jono Niger. Jono is an agroforestry planner at Regenerative Design Group Cooperative, a small worker-owned design and planning firm in Western Massachusetts. Jono has 30 plus years of professional experience in agroforestry, permaculture, ecological land and site planning, conservation and restoration. He has held positions as faculty at the Conway School of Landscape Planning and Design, restoration specialist with the Nature Conservancy, land steward at Lost Valley Educational Center and permaculture design course instructor through Sirius Eco Village. He holds a BS degree in forest biology and a master's in landscape planning and design. And he authored The Permaculture Promise and he operates Big River Chestnuts, a chestnut agroforestry farm in Sunderland, Massachusetts, which we're gonna be talking about today. And I'm so excited. So I am just absolutely thrilled to have both of you with us. You both are farmers who I look up to and who I've learned from. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. So to start off, I'd like to have each of you tell us a little bit of background about your farms, um, where they are at, how big they are, um, how they got started. Um, so Jono, why don't you start us off? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Great to be here. Uh, really excited uh, by all the amazing uh, presentations and great information. Uh, we're a small farm in Western Massachusetts uh, in the Connecticut River Valley, a uh, pretty um, strong agricultural zone in, in Western Massachusetts. The, it's a small property, less than 10 acres, of which we're farming seven and a half acres on a low floodplain terrace above the river, uh, maybe 20 feet or so. Um, and um, and so we have uh, that small area in production to, and we started in 2018 was our initial planting year. So last year was year five. And um, so we're coming in strong to year six and looking to expand uh, I could get into that later, but but we're sort of building on the success that we've had in these initial years and and getting our systems in place uh, and and we're uh, starting to look to um, expand to some other properties in the area around the um, Connecticut River Valley. So uh, yeah, that is awesome, and I'm so excited to dive more into the ecological design of your farm. Um, but Ellie, tell us about Coastal Roots Farm. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so Coastal Roots is in Southern California in North County, San Diego, and we're a 17 acre farm based on a larger 67 acre property. Um, and the property is owned by a foundation that incubated the farm. So the farm was incubated in 2015, and then we split off as our own nonprofit in 2016. So we're a nonprofit farm and education center um, on about 17 acres, and our food forest is about eight acres of that 17 acres. And Catherine is being modest. Catherine helped to manage the food forest and played a really major role in its in its establishment. 
Well, you, you took it to the next level. I just sowed the seeds and yeah, I, I got to go back a few weeks ago and it was incredible. So, um, well, both of your farms are just so unique in terms of their ecological design. Um, and so I want to talk about that and, and the different kinds of agroforestry practices you're employing. And, you know, for those of us who might be new to the term agroforestry practices, um, it just refers to the ways that we arrange trees on our farms to address a variety of goals. And I know that both of you are arranging trees on your farms in interesting ways. So um, I'd like to ask each of you, how did you decide what kinds of trees to plant and how did you decide how to arrange them? You wanna take it, Ellie? Um, sure, yeah, I can start. Um, so kind of a mix of factors. Within our food forest, we have three different kind of primary zones. Um, so the largest kind of main zone that we're currently producing in is our silva pasture. Um, so that's a system of alley cropping um, where we have rows of fruit trees. And between the rows of fruit trees, we are growing annual crops and then um, rotating our laying hens um, through those fields as well, and then also growing cover crops. So that's kind of the largest zone within our food forest. But then we also have a zone that's a little bit more densely planted with trees, kind of looks a little bit more like a forest ecosystem. And then we have a zone that currently is fallow that we're starting to plant um, native crops in. So that's going to be kind of the native zone, which in Southern California will look a little bit less foresty, um, but is definitely also an important um, area of our ecosystem that we want to create space for. Um, but within the kind of development of that, there's been a lot of different factors that have gone into it. And part of that, as a community farm, we have people constantly cycling through. So rather than a farm that's started by one person and managed by that person kind of through to completion, we have a lot of different people that have been, you know, an influence in what trees have gone in the ground, the design of different areas. Um, so that's been interesting to see that kind of, um, I guess, business management style of a food forest that has a lot of different people involved in the design and implementation. Um, but early on, the kind of overarching factors for the trees that went in were a focus on um, trees that could thrive in poor soils, trees that fix nitrogen, um, and not just trees, but understory plants as well. So for example, Albizia and African, African Senna. Um, so Albizio is a great nitrogen fixing tree. African Senna is more of a shrub, but also fixes nitrogen, produces a lot of biomass. Um, and then again, biomass producing was another factor for kind of early on. Um, and then as we started to build soil and create that microclimate, we started to plug in more fruit trees and those fruit trees um, were determined by the market demand as well as what we can efficient grow efficiently. Um, and then being in Southern California, um, a focus on more drought tolerant um, and low water need trees. Yeah, I, I love um, how the Coastal Roots Farm system there are so many different ways that you've arranged trees, you know, on, on different areas of the property. I think that sometimes um, we box ourselves into thinking about agroforestry practices as having to be separate, like, oh, this is how you do silvopasture pasture and this is how you do alley cropping. But it's really neat that you've woven together alley cropping and silvopasture pasture together. You have chickens that rotate through your alley cropping system and you have this um, successional rotation of veggies followed by cover crop followed by chickens and I just think it's so neat um the way you've designed that system and also like you said really really awesome that um you were so intentional about making sure that the trees were appropriate for Southern California with its low rainfall I think that's hugely important um yeah just thinking about deciding on tree crop combination the climate is the biggest factor that's what we have to take into account first um, so that's awesome. Nice. And yeah, Jono, tell us about, what about you? How, what, what does your um, ecological design look like and how did you decide on that? Yeah, great. Well, we're, there's a lot, some, some similarities with what you're doing there at Coastal Roots and uh, that we're, we have a um, primarily alley crop as an initial 
pattern that we've laid out. We were the main crop that we're growing is chestnuts. So that's sort of the foundation. Uh, they're Chinese hybrid varieties um, meant for a farmscape production. Um, they're they're um, laid out on 40 foot rows. So then we have the alleys between them in, in parts of the field. And then, then in, in other parts of the field, we have them on 20 foot rows. So they're much closer together. Um, we've thought through a kind of a succession plan that uh, Eric was talking about earlier, where we have run chickens underneath through the trees as they're getting established, utilizing that space, but also to boost the fertility. We've got um, a fairly degraded farmland area with compact soils. They're pretty heavy soils, heavy silt soils. So um, using the um, chicken rotations to help with uh, some of those soil conditions. And then, and then in the wider spacing alleys, we've got small fruit. We're growing elderberry, uh, aronia and black currant primarily that we're starting to bring in some more diversity uh, and and we were really focused the reason we're you know thinking chestnuts I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at different systems and worked on a lot of properties the other the other aspect of my work is that I work with regenerative design group and we do technical support and farm planning for landowners and organizations and farmers so I've um, been able to work with people in lots of different settings and sort of over time identify what are the what are the species that are ready to go? What are the crops that are ready to go in agroforestry systems that can really kind of lead the way? Uh, and there's a number of them, but definitely chestnuts are really high on that list, at least um, in many parts of the U.S. Um, the, the, they grow very well. They're um, there's um, markets are are well established and growing, um, so we're so we're sort of using that as the as a focus, and then um, and then the small fruit were chosen because they're pretty easy, they're pretty low maintenance, uh, they're super nutritive, uh, they're they're somewhat recognizable, maybe elderberry more than aronia, more than black currant, so they're you know they're they're developing um recognition and possibilities and it's also really good food it's really nutritive um and uh and really um should be parts of our diets in a in a bigger way um and then the other systems we've got other plantings around the edges uh of the property we put in a hedgerow windbreak uh actually with an NRCS equipped Grant and it's uh it's mostly hazelnuts, but it's got a lot of other um, kind of experimental um, or or trialing kind of plants in there, like um, some mulberry varieties, some northern pecans, some basket willows, and um, and so it's a pretty diversified um, chance for us to try different things out and also create some buffer from a, an adjacent uh, farm. So. Um, so yeah, those are some of the main main systems and the layout that we're going with. Well, I love that. So diversified. That's amazing. And I also love that you're learning as you go and trying out different species and seeing what fits for, for your context. I think that's that's awesome. Yeah, one um, just to yeah. add on, because the I I mentioned the three parts, which which relates to really thinking through the economics and how to get established. And we've sort of done that with the chickens as an initial you know, a way to have some income happening, to have some soil improvement. Then the small fruit started bearing in years two and three. And, and so we're starting to build that as a economic part of the farm. And then the chestnuts are just very, very much at the beginning. So we're trying to also have that succession plan for economics as well. Yeah, that is such a, a really, it's a good point just to talk about succession. Um, yeah, I, I, I do want to ask you about that, Jono, like what is your plan for the system as the chestnuts do get bigger and begin to start providing more shade? Um, are you planning on switching out your understory crop? Um, how will the system evolve? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And I definitely don't have all the answers. There's a lot of learning as we go, seeing how it evolves. Uh, there's also, um, different partners that I've worked with, different people have been involved. The um, chestnuts, or I mean, the chickens were operated by a collaborating farmer who brought that, um, brought chickens onto the land. And, and um, 
so we're I'm always looking for different ways we can partner with other people. And depending on who's excited about which parts, I could imagine that in the next 10 to 15 years, the shade component on the alley cropping and the small fruit would would increase and um, those small fruit we'd start to transplant out to the edges. Um, we might narrow them down into some very interior spaces between the chestnut rows. Um, probably the, the most likely scenario is um, continue to graze and diversify the grazing underneath the trees. I actually have a um, uh, um, house nearby, some farmers moved in and they're uh, um, sheep grazers and very experienced with um, having sheep in um, orchard areas. So, um, so I could see a really great collaboration with um, folks like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that you are thinking about how the system will change over time. Um, Ellie, I'd like to ask you the same thing. How I know that the trees in your alley cropping system are smaller than chestnuts. They're elderberries and pomegranates and figs. Um, so they likely won't shade out the understory as much as chestnuts would. But of course, the system is going to change over time and it already has. So yeah, just um, tell us a little bit about how you anticipate the system to change over time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, to build a little bit more off what we have within our silva pasture system specifically, um, it's primarily uh, pineapple guavas, pomegranates, zapotes, um, and elderberry. So, and, and then figs as well. Um, so the figs, the pineapple guavas, and the pomegranates, we are pruning pretty significantly um, to keep within a harvest, harvestable height anyway. So there's less concern about the shading. We have pretty wide spacing within our alley cropping as well. So the alleys are range from 40 to 50 feet wide. Um, and we have a roadway on one side between the trees and the crops. And then on the other side, we have a bioswale. So there is good spacing there to really um, kind of provide that room for growth. The elderberries are definitely a little bit more challenging. They grow so quickly. Um, and especially we have some intercropped on rows with other trees that we're watering and the elderberry are like dragons. <laughs> like We'll cut them all the way down and then they'll just be fully grown again within a year. Um, so that has been something that we've been playing around with different pruning methods. Um, within our rows that are entirely elderberry, we're playing around with pruning a little bit more like fruit trees. Um, rather than cutting all the way down, but we are running into some some shading um, challenges there. So that's something that we're we're actively troubleshooting. And um, some of those alleys we may um, move more in the direction of perennials. But for the most part, our primary kind of cash crop trees, um, we're not having any issues with with shade just at the height that we're keeping them them pruned to. Um, but like Jono said, that's we don't have it all figured out and you know some of that we're going to be evolving um, based on how the system uh the direction that the system takes us um but for the most part the silva pasture we're growing some kind of shorter grow and shorter um height trees yeah that's a really good point too that you can use management strategies like pruning um to keep trees at a height that you want them at for chestnuts you want them to grow big and um, for timber trees you would as well, but for certain trees, pruning them and keeping them small is, is the way to go. So that's that's a really good point. Um, I wanna go back and talk more about the chickens because you both are incorporating poultry into your systems. And I just would like to talk about some of the benefits you see to that and some of the challenges. Let's see. Well, I, I'd say um, we, we um, ran a lot of chickens through through about a four acre area. We had groups of three hundred uh, in in uh, fenced rotational fenced area, maybe fifty by fifty, and then and then moving those daily or every two to three days. Uh, so, so there was some issue just of. Um, um, we really never lost any trees or had damage to trees, but you do get a certain trampling effect with lots of the, that number. Um, if if they're not being moved enough, you can have the the manure concentrated in certain areas. 
Um, so, and as um, one of the issues that we've had is that there's not, the drainage is not great because of the tillage over many years in this area. Uh, so there's been compaction of the soil and, um, and reduced drainage. And that's one of the things we're working with with these perennial crops to increase uh, the drainage. And so, um, so we had some you know, concerns. We did some modeling of the, of the nitrogen loading into the area and the drainage and really tried to figure out what, what's the capacity here. Um, but the benefits have been that just over a few years of doing that kind of grazing and the, the, the um, just um, amazing growth of the, of the, um, the pasture mixes and just the explosion of growth. And many of those plants um, are, uh, are tap rooted and have really great deep fibrous roots. And so they're part of uh, helping to improve the drainage of the area and helping to um, cycle those nutrients through the system and, and um, create cover. And then it's creating habitat. And so the benefit has just been this like accelerating of the system and, and um, improvement of the system rapidly. So I think that the challenges of managing the chickens and, and the, the work with the livestock um, is definitely uh balanced with the, the um, just the improvement to the soil we've seen and the improvement to the health of the pasture overall. Yeah. What about you, Ellie? Um, our system is a little bit different because we're, we're not rotating the chickens around the trees. We're just rotating them through the alleys between the rows of trees where we're growing um, our annual crops. Um, so um, we've had different challenges as the trees around the alleys have gotten more established and grown. It's been hard to navigate our coops moving in and out of the alleys. We have, we're raising laying hens, um, so we have pretty sizable coops. Um, so that can be like an ever-changing obstacle course, um, backing out, uh, 20 foot long, um, trailer <laughs> coops, um, in and out of the alleys. Um, but overall it's, it's been a really functional system. We have, um, our alleys, um, open on both ends. So we're just kind of circling the coops through the alleys. And then we're, al we're also moving them through our other, um, row cropping fields. So each field, um, gets a pass of the chicken coop once a year. And that's kind of part of our fertility push. So we'll move the coop through each field, um, following a crop. So the chickens are able to clear um, any crop residue left in the fields, which is mutually beneficial. Um, and then following the chickens, we actually grow our cover crop. Um, and so that gives a little bit of time, um, both in terms of food safety regulation, but also um, just the breakdown um, of the manure from the chickens. Um, and that's when we apply our compost as well. So that has created a really nice system of kind of a concentrated fertility push within each field that's also benefiting the chickens, keeping them moving through um, fresh soil and um, getting to eat the crop residue in the fields. Yeah, that that is, it's such a dialed in system, that rotation. Um, and you brought up a good point about the timing of it, making sure that it is in line with food safety standards. You know, FSMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, there are standards with when you can incorporate annu animals into a, a um, a production system, a, a produce system. Um, and then also organic, there, there are organic pra practice standards if the system is organic. Um, and so can you talk a little bit more about the timing of your rotation um, and how it aligns with those standards? Yeah, yeah, those standards um, were definitely a determining factor in us shaping that system. We probably would have mapped out the cover crop before the chickens if it weren't for that. Um, it's 120 days. so. Um, animals or fresh manure applied to a field, there's a 120, 120 day wait period before harvesting a crop. Um, so for some crops, that's not that big of a deal because it's not the seeding timing, it's the harvesting and some crops take close to 120 days from seed to maturity. Um, but to not have that variable and that kind of like added challenge in crop planning, um, we decided to move the cover crop to following the chickens so that we'll always have that window kind of dedicated um, to soil fertility. The soil's not sitting fallow. We've got active cover crop growing and continuing to feed that soil microbiome. Um, and that also ended up working out that the chickens are able to just eat our 
leftover crop residue. That saves us the time of clearing those beds. Um, the chickens do an amazing job of clearing the beds. It is incredible to see we'll have, you know, full squash plants that just disappear um, in the time that the chickens are there. So the food safety 120 day regulation um, kind of shaped our, our system, but it ultimately, I think, worked out for the best overall. Yeah. And, and for your cover crop, um, what, what kind of cover crop are you planting? And then how do you terminate it? So we're growing a drought tolerant blend of Blando Brome Martigina, which is a, a mustard um, and common vetch. Um, so we've got that Blando Brome is a deep rooted grass. Um, the Martigina is, um, produces a lot of biomass and then the vetch is nitrogen fixing. Um, and it's very drought tolerant. So we're able to get it established and then um, essentially turn off the water, especially during the winter. Um, so then we'll mow one to three times, depending on the timing of the field and when we need to plant the next crop um, and seasonality. And then we'll do a final mow and then cover them with occultation tarps, which are essentially silage tarps. Um, and that fully terminates the cover crop and does an incredible job at breaking it down. Um, that was what enabled us to transition fully to no-till. So before that we had been tilling in our cover, cover crop material. Um, but the occultation tarps do such a good job of breaking down the material that we're able to either transplant directly into it or um, a light hoe and raking, um, and it's ready for direct seeding. So that's kind of our bed prep um, protocol after the fertility push. That's awesome. I love that. Jonna, what about you? Do you have any um, tips about navigating food safety laws when you integrate chickens? Yeah, we're it's a it's a definitely a challenge, and uh, with the chestnuts which are being harvested late September into October, that means for the 120 days that um, livestock need to be off of those fields uh, in June or so, late June, and uh, so it's a it's a it's a challenge. I think it's something that uh, that there's. Um, been an effort to address it and and recognize that chestnuts come when they fall down they fall out of the burrs they're in a shell they're protected from pathogens but um, as far as the FDA review of it they they assessed that um, enough people enough people who responded to the survey said that they would eat them raw uh, that they um, they kept that rule in place so we're hopeful that that could get changed over time and it would really increase the flexibility of that of our of our grazing system underneath them yeah it, it is important to keep in mind and um yeah it's part of it so mm -hmm. i'd like to switch gears and just talk about some of the benefits of agroforestry that you see on your farms um and you know one of the main benefits of agroforestry is that agroforestry systems tend to overyield. that is they tend to produce more than systems would if they were just growing monocultures. Um, so do you both feel that your systems have yielded more as a result of utilizing agroforestry? Hmm. Well, I would say, I would say that we're in the position where our main crop, the chestnuts, um, are just coming into production. We just got just about just under a one pound per tree uh in year five. So um they're just little little babies getting going on, on a you know a hundreds of years lifespan. Um so we're I I think we'll definitely have over yield right now as I was talking about earlier the the other crops are really filling in the gap of that establishment period. They're helping to carry us over uh, while the trees come into production, the, the main trees, as well as hazelnuts and and other other trees that I I didn't even mention, pawpaws and persimmons and um, yellowbud hickories that we've got going. So um, so I think the um, the diversity that we have will definitely create that over yield situation where there's just so much uh, being harvested. Uh, we've um, have herbalists who come onto the land seasonally and they'll pick dandelions or other other perennial herbs that are just growing within the edge zones. Um, we've got um, uh, a, a lot of um, side 
sort of specialty small crops that are that are woven in i think that create that that over yield yeah pretty similar for us um i think we uh like jono said a lot of our trees are just starting to fruit um we're just kind of in the second or third year where they're really coming on um so we're starting to see that i think in terms of the efficiency of our alley cropping to tree cropping in our silva pasture. There's a little bit of space saved there. Um, the roadways are doubling up where we would have roadways between rows of trees. That's doubling up as our roadway next to our field. Um, so that's definitely creating a little bit of space, space efficiency. I think we have a lot of room to grow into directly under our trees. So we have some herbs established under our trees, but that's a good amount of space that um, we could definitely be maximizing yields and I see potential there and we haven't fully reached that potential. Um, we're similarly harvesting a lot of wild crops around the food forest. So we just um, harvested a big batch of wild greens, which was wild mustard, nettle and malva and it sold out at our farm stand and we sell nettle, we sell malva um, individually as well. Um, so definitely see benefits there. Um, but we also have a lot of grass growing under our trees and we don't sell that. Um, so there's definitely room to, to kind of intentionally maximize some of that space that is left a little bit more, um, wild directly under our trees. Yeah. And, you know, also one of the challenges of agroforestry is, is competition between overstory and understory. Um, I think, yes, in an ideal world, you would be maximizing your vertical space and harvesting from your overstory and harvesting from your understory, but there is competition between species. Um, is that something that you've experienced, both of you? Have you experienced competition for water, nutrients, light um, on your farms? Hmm. Well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, not super noticeably um we have run into certain issues like we have nasturtium that has kind of taken over under some of our pineapple guavas that's been problematic and it's you know creating great beneficial habitat but then it's also um definitely kind of choking out some of the pineapple guavas our elderberry like i mentioned before um is our main competitor um tree species that um, is constantly like popping back up under other trees as we try and prune it back. Um, it's producing a lot of biomass, which is great um, and definitely pollinator and predatory insect habitat. But um, for the most part, because of the spacing of our annual crops separate from our tree crops, we haven't run into um, any noticeable competition issues, but we are also irrigating. Um, so I think if we were to turn off, um, our irrigation on our berms, um, where our trees are planted, then we might start to see more noticeable, um, competition with our annual crops. But I think we have pretty ample spacing that that hasn't been an issue so far. And that's, that's a great point that with proper design and proper spacing, you can prevent a lot of that competition. Yeah. Yeah, similarly, I don't think we've seen uh, competition between the crops. One of the main criteria for, for these plants, the, the small fruit, the elderberry aronia, currants, the, the chestnuts, the hazelnuts, and others is was really their their toughness and their ability to um to handle some competition from grasses and 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 field field plants and other perennial herbs um the there is of course during establishment that couple years of of needing to have them well mulched and and um we use we use a lot of wood chip mulch and some paper and cardboard and um just just to give them that couple years of um less competition from the surrounding plants um and otherwise otherwise there's not been a lot of root competition i think that over the decades, the chestnuts um, will definitely be growing into all the field areas. So that will be something that we'll be looking at. And, and I'm sure that it will affect some of the other crops differently. And, and if there's um, 
you know, they're, they're just going to be down there rooting deep and, and, uh, and pulling up nutrients and water, um, that that's not going to be available for some of the other plants, but that's, I think that's where we start to really get into the nuance and, and over time, um, how do these different combinations, uh, work and, and which ones could be better. The hazelnuts and chestnuts is a very old pattern in Northern Europe, um, um, with, the um, chestnuts on long rotations or, um, or oak trees on long rotations and then, um, hazelnuts, um, on a shorter rotation. So I think, I think that's the kind of thing we'd be looking towards is seeing what's the right, um, what's the right pairing for the, for the real long-term. Absolutely. Yeah. Selecting different tree crop combinations that, um, have roots that may occupy different niches in the soil. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is, you know, having a really intentional design um, and modifying that design over time is something I know both of you are doing, and it's um, crucial to the success of an agroforestry system. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about resilience. This conference is about growing hope and increasing resilience on our farm. So I'd like to talk um, about resilience. And if you think that agroforestry has increased your farm's resilience at all. Um, let's just talk about, um, yeah, resilience on your farms, if that's something you've experienced. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say uh, we're, um, we're feeling like it's, um, there's a high level of resilience. Last year in the Northeast, uh, we had one of the most severe droughts on record, um, that, that, uh, um, is just, it's, uh, it was just, it was, a um, really pretty traumatic actually around the region for a lot of the farms. And, um, so we, we raised and did put irrigation into the small fruit, but the chestnut trees that were established really did fine. They're, they're, um, they're tough and, um, and they, they, had a great season and, and we had our best harvest to date. So I feel like that part of the resilience is the diversity of having different crops happening so that we're going to have those tough years. We're going to have drought. We're going to have some flood seasons and um, different crops are going to respond to that differently. So I think that we're, we're set up pretty well for that in the, in the diversity that we've got. Um, and, and there's a lot of um, community resilience around us. There's a lot of sharing within the farmer network. Uh, there's a, um, a lot of uh, people looking to learn and, and reskill and learning about soil health, learning about, about perennial crops. So we've been really getting um, a, a lot of uh, excitement within the area about what we're doing and a lot of people coming to check it out. And so I feel like that's woven into the resilience at another level that um, it's pretty exciting. That is exciting. And Justin Moore has put in the chat and I couldn't agree more, diversity equals resilience. It's so true in, in economic terms, in ecological terms, diversity mm -hmm. is resilience. Yeah. What about you, Ellie? I know that San Diego experiences drought all the time. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and um, whether the way that you've arranged trees on your property, has that helped with drought? Has it made it worse? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely hasn't made it worse. <laughs> um, we, so I guess two things come to mind. The first um, is that we've noticed differences um, within our soil in the food forest compared to our, the rest of our crop fields. The soil in our food forest has had higher organic matter in soil tests. Um, and has had noticeably better water retention. So um, the runtime, I actually lower the runtime in the food forest annual crops compared to the other annual crops throughout our farm. So it's been really cool to see that degree of um, water retention within the soil. The history of the soil within our food forest is also pretty wild when um, factoring that in. We, before any trees were planted in the food forest about eight years ago, it was a um, dumping ground for construction backfill, um, as well as spent potting mix from um, flower, cut flower greenhouse production. So it was 
very, very disturbed, um, biologically inactive soil. And so to see that now compared to our other vegetable production fields has been really cool. And some of that is definitely our fertility push with our chickens and cover cropping, but we're doing that in our other fields as well. So there's definitely a degree of um, impact from the trees um, built into the ecosystem. Um, and then aside from the soil, we're also seeing um, huge increases in biodiversity and other species as well. So we have birders come out every few months and we have over 90 species of birds documented in our food forest, um, which is the main species that we're regularly tracking, but qualitatively that's across the spectrum. We have uh, incredible biodiversity in that space. We're seeing tons of parasitic wasps and a variety of different pollinators that um, is definitely in higher populations than we're seeing on the rest of the farm. Um, and then I guess in terms of the, the water piece as well, our trees are planted on contour. So before the any trees were put in, we partnered with another um, regenerative landscaping company, Ecology Artisans, and they mapped out the contour um, within that eight acre um, piece of land and dug um, berms and bioswales. And our trees are all planted on berms above the bioswales. So we only get about 12 inches of rain a year here. So there's only so much to capture, but when that rain does come, our soil is typically um, not so much in the food forest, but typically the soil here is extremely hydrophobic when the rain does come. And so then you get tons of runoff. That's where the, the main topsoil erosion comes in. And so those berms and swales have really helped to slow and capture the rain when it does come. And it's been really exciting to see they do fill. Um, and that is capturing what rain we do get um, and also preventing the damage that would happen um, if we didn't have those berms and swales in place. Yeah, I remember um, when I worked there that there was one year that we didn't have to irrigate in the winter for four months, which is unprecedented in California. That never happens. And just the fact that those berms and swales were able to capture that much water, it was incredible. And, and I know that they're not, berms and swales are definitely a practice that's not appropriate to every context, but in certain contexts, it's, it's a very appropriate practice. And I know that the tree roots really help to stabilize those berms and swales and so it's, it's just amazing. I definitely think um, it's an awesome practice for certain parts of Southern California. Yeah. Great. Jono, what about you? Have you seen any biodiversity benefits on your farm? Oh yeah. Amazing. Amazing. We've worked in several properties in more hilly areas where we put in uh, swales and, and seen, seen dramatic results, even in our much wetter climate, but it makes a difference on degraded slopes and um, with, with tree establishment for sure. Um, yeah, the 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 fields um, have really exploded. They're they're um, it's really interesting. We're basically in a floodplain forest, um, a, a terrace, uh, the low terrace above the um, Connecticut River. So it's so it's really diverse in the the trees along the the adjacent woodland areas, and then within the field, there um, just the we have a lot of um, mud unmowed. So I'll, I'll use this practice within the alleys that I didn't really talk about where we'll let them go for a year, um, some places even a couple years, and, and on a very kind of different um, mowing rotation. One is just to allow that wild growth to happen, um, both to support all the pollinators, the birds nesting in there. Um, and then the other part of that is we have very low organic matter, and I mentioned the compaction. And um, so I'll come through with the flail mower uh, um, every once in a while, and it's basically a, a short rotation coppice right in place. So we'll just shred that material up, all the sapling um, regrowth um, and the herbs, and, um, and we'll get a nice um, layer of uh, organic matter over the soil. So we're doing that sp sporadically or, or just variably in the different parts of the field. So we're always having these patches that are just full of uh, flowers and pollinators and, and um, incredible habitat um, activity. And, and, then, um, and then other patches that are in different stages. So there's sort of these like successional patches. Um, and, and yeah, we're seeing just 
you know, we have we have um, a lots of activities, um, a lot of bird activity. We have uh, crows that will follow us along when we're mowing, and they'll be coming and uh, doing some of the vole hunting for us, and um, um, lots of uh, lots of um, yeah, and 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 lots of wildlife coming and vole hunting. We had a bear in the field last year. Um, probably uh-huh. just moving through the valley, looking for somewhere else to be. So, um, so yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. And one of the, one of the um, exciting parts of the farm is it's really beautiful. It's a, it's a, and it's a beautiful place to visit during the growing season. And so we can invite people there to come and say, come and come and hang out, come and be on the farm and experience a place that is productive. We're grow, we're growing all this great food, and it's a just a beautiful spot. Um, with full of life. And I think that's one of the big draws for people it gets people really excited. That is such a good point that when we think about the benefits of agroforestry, one of the benefits is its benefit to humans, just in terms of its, its beauty. Humans love trees, humans love wild places. And to be able to provide that is, is, is beautiful. Um, I think that the social benefit is, is really important to talk about too. And the community benefit. I know that um, both of your farms do incorporate the community to some degree. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Ellie, do you want to start? I know Coastal Roots Farm, its mission is to incorporate the community. Yeah, we actually just had our food forest festival, um, which we do every year. And that's um, this year we had a thousand people, um, which was our, our biggest yet. Um, but that's just a, an annual festival that we do Um to bring people out and experience the space and kind of be integrated in. Um, And then we're also um, starting to establish smaller spaces throughout the food forest for programming. So we have programming spaces throughout the rest of our farm, but um, we have just carved out a space kind of in the center of our food forest that will be um, specifically designated for programs. We have a lot of school and group visits that come through. So we partner with two different school districts and all of their fourth grade classes come out um, and our farm has developed, our education staff has developed a curriculum um, paired with those school districts. So it's really an opportunity for a lot of young people to come out. We do adult education as well. Um, so that's definitely um, a big part of our mission um, and what we're doing. And we're constantly looking for ways to integrate the production side of what we're doing with the, the education side. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, we're we're also uh, excited to have um, groups come out, school groups, uh, community groups. Uh, we've held a number of farmer field days just to to invite farmers out and and extension and and um, um, technical support folks to to see what we're doing. Uh, we've been having a chestnut festival for the last two years, so that's been a lot of fun and. Uh, um, having people cook different dishes and food demos and, um, roasting chestnuts. And so it's a big seasonal celebration. In addition to them, we're also, um, roasting chestnuts every Sunday through the fall, basically from the end of September, uh, right up till Christmas. And, um, and that brings a lot of people out. There's just such, a, um, excitement, in the community because the the cultural connections a lot of people with uh with their um chestnuts is part of their heritage or um their family um family traditions and so so we're really reconnecting that and and um and um so we've been having a lot of people come out and uh and visit that's amazing gosh i want to go to one of those chestnut roasts that sounds incredible <laughs> A lot of fun. The Food Forest Festival at Coastal Roots is great. That one I know well, and it is a blast. Um, And yeah, I do think it's really important. It's 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 wonderful when a farm can be a place for the community to gather. And obviously, you know, not every farm is going to have that as part of its goals or missions, but it is really neat when that does happen. Um, Well, we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience, and we've got ten more minutes, so I'm going to transition to some of the questions from our chat. one question we did kind of talk about this, but have you seen any changes over time in terms of birds and insect populations? We talked about birds, but what about insect populations and does that translate to IPM benefits? Hmm. Anything, Ellie? You- <laughs> 
Yeah, mm -hmm. we've definitely seen increase. I mean, we're not doing very organized monitoring, so I can't speak to specific numbers, but we've definitely seen increases in um, parasitic wasps, lacewing, ladybugs, um, earthworms. We have tons of earthworms in our soil, which is pretty wild for Southern California sandy soils. Um, and it definitely has played into our IPM approach. Um, in addition to the rows of trees, we plant um, beneficial flowering plants along all of our irrigation headers for our fields. So we have a lot of fennel, a lot of alyssum, um, calendula marigolds, and then some different native flowering plants. Um, and we have definitely made a concerted effort. We're certified organic, but we do spray um, neem oil, um, tritech, and BT. But we've made a really concerted effort to um, really assess those thresholds um, based on what we're seeing in a given field. And um, if we are seeing predatory um, or beneficial activity, really trying to push that threshold to where um, we really need to spray for like an, an aphid outbreak, um, for example. Um, but again, we're not doing really organized monitoring. So it's all just my very biased opinion. <laughs> Yeah, same same with us. Really, no nothing formal uh, in our tracking. Anecdotally, it it looks like there's an increase in all the pollinator activity, all the um the, just the um, around the the flowering hedges and edge edges that we have. But um, but it's hard to know. We're still pretty early. We're just five years in. We've done a lot of soil tracking. Uh, we had a, a SARE grant that we um, used to uh, fund some deep dives into soil um, soil changes over the first five years, and and really what we saw was some very um, initial changes in the soil biology, um, in the breaking up of some of those compacted layers, but but it's just just initial initial changes that we expect to continue as the as the trees and the other perennial crops get going. So I think these these are things that take a lot of effort to track and and that's a a place to even invite people in invite you know uh, um, people who are doing their master's research or, or graduate studies or or just wanting to um, um, do some some investigation into that I think I think it's a place that we could use more support to really try and understand um, when I was talking about those that different kinds of mowing regimes what how could we tweak that to to better support the pollinators um, and to um, to better support the other other tree crops there yeah it's a good point that you know it is really it's a lot of work to monitor these things and to actually quantify and that is a job for a grad student somewhere. Um, but it's true that, um, you know, there are studies that have shown that in general, agroforestry systems do have lots of IPM benefits um, and do a better job at controlling pests um, than, than monocultures do, um, or even diversified annual systems, which is really interesting, I think. Um, so it's neat that your observations line up with, with that. Yeah. I think also just in terms of an organic and especially regenerative approach, you really have to lean into biodiversity. That's really, it's a different framework. Conventional agriculture is much more about controlling an ecosystem, you know, to varying degrees, but from um, more intensive pesticide application um, to fertilizer application to sometimes fumigating soils, it's just much more of a framework of trying to minimize variables within an ecosystem where regenerative agriculture doesn't have that option um, within a lot of those aspects of conventional agriculture, some of the chemicals um, and, and tools used, um, but also just the whole kind of philosophical approach is much more about working within an ecosystem and moving more in that direction of biodiversity and bringing balance to an ecosystem. But coming into a disturbed ecosystem, that takes a really long time. And it's it's a many, many year process. Totally. Yeah, that's such a good point that these changes do not happen overnight at all. And we have to be patient. And yeah, sometimes you might have to spray pesticides in the interim, organic or, you know, but yeah, the, these systems take time and that's okay. Yeah. 
Well, let's see. We have some more questions coming in. Are these systems generating profit? And if not, how long do you anticipate to generating a return to your in initial investment? I know this is a question that often comes up when we talk about agroforestry because trees are such a big investment and they do take a really long time to grow. But we, you kind of talked a little bit about it, about planting um, an understory in the meantime to generate profit and how your chickens are generating profit. Do you have any other thoughts on that? On that? Yeah, we're 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 anticipating. You know, it's all kind of projections and and um, talking with a lot of other growers to try and gauge how the trees will come. Uh, online, developing markets. We've been working a lot with the um, with the Sunday market I was talking about of um, bringing in chestnuts from other places and kind of priming the pump and and educating people locally about chestnuts to to build that um, market and excitement as our production increases. We're we're imagining that we're going to break even on our year by year costs, probably around year eight so in the next three to four years and then as we get past that we'll be starting to pay off the the net investment uh costs of the of the chestnuts and the other planting so it's like a, we're imagining yeah it's a good 18 20 20 year process to really um to really get going and we're we're already looking ahead I've, i mentioned additional plantings that would would really help um, increase our growing, our capacity. We're, we're looking at um, investing in processing equipment. We've written a, a, a pretty large state grant recently uh, to help with funding for processing equipment that we would um, be able to um, offer for other growers in the area and create an aggregation hub uh, for chestnuts, but also other nut crops and perennial crops and uh, so that our, we're pretty centrally located. It's very easy to access uh, from different parts of the region. And so we could um, be that kind of hub place. And I think that's sort of another benefit that we can offer and that helps helps the, the whole farm also. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Um, yeah, we have a very different business model as a nonprofit. Um, so we're primarily grant funded, and then we actually donate a lot of our food to food insecure communities in our area. Um, and then we have a farm stand, which is pay as you can. So overall, we're donating about 70% of our produce annually. Um, so definitely a very different business model, and we're not tracking in a lot of the same ways that a for-profit farm would be. Um, but in terms of the um, revenue of our annual crops relative to our food forest, we're still definitely within what we're selling, making the majority of our revenue from our annual crops. Um, but we are starting to see within a couple of our tree crops um, that kind of payoff starting to take um, come to fruition. So for example, our pineapple guavas and our pomegranates, the past um, two years we've harvested hundreds of pounds from each um, with very little input um, labor or uh, material wise. So we're basically pruning each of those crops once annually, um, fertilizing, and there's not a lot of other input that's going into those trees now that they're established. So we're really starting to see um, those trees start to show a lot more efficiency than our annual crops, but overall the majority of our earned revenue is still coming from our, our annual crops at this point. Um, but again, we're um, definitely in a different um, business model than, than John or a for-profit farm. And you're growing yeah. pineapple guavas too. <laughs> and there's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it, it is a different business model and it's really interesting. I mean, there are so many different types of, of business models and they're all, they're all valid. Um, and both of you brought up the point again, that diversity equals resilience, um, economically, you know, being able to sell your annual understory crop in the meantime, while your trees are growing, that's resilience. So, um, I, I, I think that answers that question. Um, we have just one more minute. Um, 
I guess, yeah, one more question. Uh, have you considered other livestock in rotation in addition to chickens? We have and ultimately decided against, um, we considered sheep and goats um, and ultimately um, partially for our spacing. Um, it, the space required to be really um, properly rotating um, ruminants through pasture um, requires much more than what we have. So we would need a holding area um, and it just really wouldn't work with the system we have in place with our annual crop. So it would have really changed up the entire system um, to add a ruminant to, this, to that um, setup that we have. We also, again, as a community farm, don't have um, staff on site seven days a week. And so um, larger animals that require more care would have really um, required a different staffing structure as well. So for us, organizationally, it hasn't made sense um, more on the logistics side, but we have um, definitely uh, considered the idea. Yes, yeah, similarly, I think I think sheep uh, I mentioned earlier are a possibility, and especially as we look to expand, would have some larger fields, uh, and that the sheep would fit in really well over time as they get established. I think it's a really good combination. Other other livestock really depends if if um, if we could do the layouts and the fencing right. So um, so say goats wouldn't be able to get to the trees, um, and uh, and they could be moved through and then moved out um, for the harvest. So so yeah, I think there's some other possibilities, and a lot of it's to be determined. A lot of times with as the systems are early, there just needs to be an establishment time, and then then there's ability to move in different directions and bring in different livestock or uh, different understory crops. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Well, we are at time. So I wanna thank you both so much for taking the time out of your very busy days to be with us and to share your knowledge and experiences. Um, it really means the world. So thank you so much. Um, and we do have so many more questions that came through the chat. So again, um, we will be saving the chat and I will do my best to go through and um, answer some questions and send that out to participants after the conference. Um, but Ellie and Jono, thank you so much again.